Welcome to the Spokane City Council Legislative Session for August 29th, 2022. Please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Council President Biggs. Here. Council Member Bingle. Here. Council Member Cathcart. Present. Council Member Kinnear. Present. Council Member Stratton. Here. Council Member Zapone. Here. Council Member Wilkerson. Present. <laughs> Let the record reflect that all council members are present. All right. So we're going to have a moment of poetry at the podium by Yvonne, if you want to come up. And then after that, we're going to have a proclamation and an administrative report and a neighborhood presentation. Yvonne, if you could please introduce yourself. Good evening. My name is Yvonne Higgins Leach. My neighborhood is the Cliff Park Cannon Hill area. Mm -hmm. The title of my poem is Return to My Old Neighborhood. <clears throat> As I pass the willow lined pond, the wheels on my bike click over new cement cracks from the toll of winter's thaw. How is it that much has not changed? The arms of the same cedars droop over the same sidewalks. Patches of drenched lawn sprout through snow, and the two-story houses still sit clotted in time. The early spring sun braids through the pine-dotted park. I turn the familiar corner towards my elementary school. The now faint rain paints a black scrawl across the playground. The old oak we climbed, stark gray trunk blotched and bare like a ghost, welcomes me to come sit among her branches. Whenever I return, I ask, is it a dying or a new breath? A robin lands in a nearby vacant lot, twitches its tail twice, and drops a seed. Thanks, Yvonne. Thank you. Really appreciate it. All right, we're going to have a proclamation this evening, uh, Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, and Council Member Stratton is going to give that proclamation, and Leslie Woodfill, if you want to come up, you'll get to say a few words as well. Council Member Stratton. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Can we stand here? Or you, want to... you can stand right behind the mic. I'll read it, and then <clears throat> I'll bring you this, and you can have a few minutes to inform us. Okay. Whereas cancer is the second leading cause of death in children, exceeded only by accidents in the United States, and approximately 15,780 children under the age of 19 years will be diagnosed with cancer this year in the U.S., with approximately 88 new cases in the inland northwest. And cancer in childhood occurs randomly and spares no ethnic groups, socioeconomic class, or geographic region. And tragically, every year, an estimated 2,000 children under the age of 20 lose their lives to cancer. And whereas the city of Spokane recognizes the devastating effects of cancer on the children of this region and stands with them and their families, acknowledging that they are one of our most precious resources and encourages all efforts towards finding a cure and promoting the gold ribbon as a symbol of solidarity. And whereas the American Childhood Cancer Organization Inland Northwest is celebrating nearly 50 years of making a difference in the lives of children with cancer and their families through education, support, serving, and advocacy. Now therefore I, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim September 2022 as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in Spokane and encourage all citizens to consider wearing a gold ribbon to honor childhood cancer patients, survivors, their families, and caregivers, and those young people who have lost their lives to this devastating disease. Thank you for being here. 
smile for a picture. Thank you for recognizing us tonight. Um, Childhood Cancer Month is September 1st through the 30th. Um, we kick it off on the 1st with uh, an awareness of the, the gold ribbon. And so you as council members are um, a great uh, voice in our community to let people know that where when we had this proclamation um, issued, there was in the 80s, and now there's in the 90s of kids who are in active treatment right now at Sacred Heart Hospital. Our kids range from <clears throat> 0 to 19. They're from eastern Montana, northern Idaho, and all of eastern Washington. They're being served at Sacred Heart Hospital because that's where the cancer um, community gathers for the medical treatments. Uh, we have two program people. We have somebody who's there Monday through Friday, and we've just um, brought on Lindsay, who's our part-time person, who's on weekends and holidays. So we're able to offer 365-day coverage to our families as they are in uh, the throes of everything that cancer does for or to a child. And uh, we're excited to be able to have uh, support for those families. And it, you know, it might be as easy as um, wheelchair races to keep their minds off of what's going on down the hallways. It might be that we're supplying resource books to them, food, um, emergency funds so that they can pay their um, uh, cell phone bills, their electric bills, their mortgage, a car payment, car repairs. But uh, every, every September, we want to bring an awareness of that childhood cancer is a major thing in the Inland Northwest. We raise money locally, and that money stays here in the community. No money ever goes out that we raise. We have uh, several different programs that we're working on. Uh, if you're into coffee, go to Wake Up Call on the 8th. There's donating money. We have a candlelight vigil that we would love for you to come and attend, and it's at the Glover Mansion, and it's honoring those children whose walk with cancer has perhaps not been uh, the turnout that um, everyone would wish for. We also have a blood drive, and everybody's got blood. So <laughs> on uh, the 14th up at Rosars on 29th, we would love it if you'd participate. And if you'd like to celebrate, we have our gala on the 30th to kind of finish out the month. Um, we are so glad to be here and so honored to have this proclamation uh, so that we can post and have an awareness that childhood cancer exists in the Inland Northwest. We need a cure. And until then, we need support for our families. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming down. All right, we're going to have an administrative report um, from Frontier. Um, uh, well, I don't know if it's Frontier, actually. Mental Health Crisis Stabilization Center update. It's going to be Dan Sigler. Dan, I believe you're on uh, virtual. If you're there, go ahead. Let yes, us know what's going on there. Great. Um, yes, uh, good to be here with you, um, City Council, and thank you, uh, Council President Beggs. Uh, yes, I'm, my name is Dan Sigler. I'm with Pioneer Human Services, and um, uh, we operate the Spokane Regional Stabilization Center, which opened last October, which was, uh, as you know, a joint effort with the City of Spokane and Spokane County um, around trying to create a, uh, you know, a alternative to uh, to jail for individuals who encounter law enforcement and might be in a substance use or mental health crisis, where um, uh, by coming to the program they could get treatment. Uh, as an alternative um, in those situations. And so we just wanted to give a six month report for um, how things are going um, for the first six months of 2022. And I believe that uh, there is a presentation um, slides that will be able to be shared here. We'll kind of walk through that. Dan, I did make Karen a presenter so that she could share it. Would you like me to do so for you or do you need us to walk through it on our end? Um, let's see. I can um, share it unless Karen has it readily available. Yeah, why don't you share it with me? Okay. Or make me a, a, the ability to share. All right, you should have that share button now. Okay, great. 
So as I mentioned, just wanted to give a um, six month report uh, for the first half of 2022. So um, I just run through some of the metrics real quick here on just some of the pieces that we're seeing. One of the things that we do in the program is we always try to stay um, in touch with the, um, the patient voice and client voice of the folks that are coming into the program. So we do uh, a patient satisfaction survey with uh, uh, people when they're discharging from the program. And so far, you know, a, in a one out of four, uh, generally services are ranked at a 3.5. So that's good in terms of patient experience. So far, uh, we've served 511 people in 2022 up through June. Um, we have a readmission rate of 18%, which means that um, for individuals, some uh, may come back and get you know, uh, additional help later on. Um, and so about 18% of those that are coming through, they may not have gotten connected with, say, for example, outside services with another agency in time, or um, it could be a, some other reason, but about 18% might come back a second time from some additional help. Um, and then we're able to, you know, been able to confirm kind of follow-up visits um, after discharge with, with a behavioral health provider for about 47%. Um, this was intended also to, you know, create a way for law enforcement to uh, be able to bring the person to the program and we could do um, the medical clearance and um, the uh, initial assessment uh, so that they would be able to go back out into the field where uh, they need to be. And so the average drop-off time has been about 15 minutes. Um, and then um, about 6% of our the referrals came from rural areas. Um, and on average, we had about 37 people in the facility receiving services in a given day. Um, we were also able to treat about 22% had um, chronic medical conditions that were untreated that we were able to uh, begin treatment for when they were in the program. Uh, part of that is because about 70% of um, individuals that are coming to the program are without shelter. Um, so uh, they haven't been able to necessarily access, uh, readily access healthcare. So that's been a, a very positive part of the program's ability to um, restart treatment for medical conditions. Um, and let's see, uh, you know, we also track kind of the satisfaction of the first responders who are working with the program. And so we have, you know, the first responder and law enforcement um, satisfaction rates are 3.6 out of four. So that means they're generally pretty satisfied with working with the program. Um, and, you know, about, uh, like I said, about uh, 32 percent of people have shelter when they're coming to the program. So that means 60, um, 68 percent don't. Uh, and of those, you know, about 78 percent have improved uh, housing at the time when they're leaving. So that's just some of the number stuff. And I will um, go on to the next slide here where we're talking about the um, utilization by different law enforcement agencies. And you can see here that um, this is really kind of about what we expected, which is Spokane Police Department is about 60% of the referrals. And then um, Spokane Valley is about 22%. Spokane County Sheriff's Office is right around 20%. And then we just get a handful from some of the other outlying areas. Uh, you know, just some highlights really coming from some of the patients. Uh, one, uh, one quote here from someone said that, you know, uh, when I got here, I was lower than I could have imagined a human being could get and still be alive. You supported my recovery, gave me coping skills, treated me like a human and gave me a well overdue haircut. I've been living a life that I never imagined I would reach so quickly. I'm confident in making right decisions. I make my own appointments, reach out to others when needed uh, and help others in need at any given chance to let them know my story in hopes that they too can be guided to recovery. And another person said, I honestly felt safe and everyone was really kind. Uh, I have learned so much staying here uh, everyone, and I and know everyone's story and why they're here. I honestly recommend this for people who um, really need it. And another person said, I was paid extra attention to throughout the first night 
when I was here, which helped me ease my worries about the possibility of seizures happening. So uh, that's just some of the feedback we're getting from patients. And then some from the first responders, um, you know, I really love SRSC. I don't have issues and it's, it's great. I usually only stay for 10 to 20 minutes each time to make sure everything goes smoothly. Um, and like I said, we're serving kind of multiple agencies and working really closely with a lot of the other, a lot of other um, partners in the community, including Frontier Behavioral Health, uh, STARS, uh, CHAZ, Salvation Army. We actually work a fair amount with some of the transitional housing, giving some of the, um, given the lack of available housing, uh, we're working quite a bit with some of the transitional housing programs um, in town to try to uh, identify next steps for people, or in some cases, people may get longer term uh, treatment in an inpatient program. And uh, we're continuing to try to improve in a number of areas, um, communication with our community stakeholders. Uh, part of that being wanted to present to you here today and give you this update and uh, continue to build out more partnerships and um, expand knowledge of the program and how to utilize it for law enforcement um, and continue to work on improving coordination, tracking and reporting um, as it relates to a lot of times just working with some of the hospitals. Uh, it's getting uh, better and better every day and I'll find ways to improve. And um, that's it. That's what I have for today for the update. Council President, can I, can I ask him a question? Please do. So my understanding, the regional is fully occupied, but they closed the Kalispell stabilization, uh, which provide many of the same services that you all do. Do you know what that is or what is your relationship with the Kalispell Stabilization Center? So uh, we have general, so we've worked uh, with Frontier Behavioral Health who runs the Kalispell um, that, so we work with their team pretty regularly and we, um, we meet with them actually weekly where they're triaging, you know, which, uh, you know, which, which folks are more appropriate for our facility, which it has to do more with, uh, you know, those that are coming in contact with law enforcement versus the, um, uh, really just the general rest of the community where there are mental health needs. And so it's really, uh, kind of been a different target group that we're trying to work with. Um, I know that um, after that, the other stabilization did um, close down. I don't, I, my understanding is that it was going to be temporary, but that, you know, we started to see an influx of referrals that from, that probably would have generally gone to that facility. Mm -hmm. And we haven't really, you know, it's been beyond our, our capacity to meet all of those needs. I also know that, um, uh, the Inland Northwest Behavioral Health Hospital serves a very um, similar patient group as well, and that's um, that they have, they have I think 75 bed uh, facility. That's the partnership with Providence, um, and so between this program and that program, I think that um, the this stabilization has been more for a a group that really wasn't um, fitting into the other systems because of you know sometimes arrests or charges, or this is more for the folks that might have otherwise been uh, in the jail. Um, so I don't think there's too much of a relationship between Foothills closing uh, and this other, I mean, as we worked with them, our understanding was that it was, you know, um, partly, you know, staffing driven and partly um, census, but I don't know more than that. Thank you. Any other questions for Dan? All right. Thanks for all the good work. Pioneer Dan, thanks for reporting in. Great, thank you. I will stop sharing here. All right. Great. All right, then let's move on to a report from the West Central neighborhood. Liz Marlin, longtime leader there. If you're there, Liz, tell us what's going on in West Central. There we go, that's a little better. Hi, how's it going? 
Give me just one moment. I'll go ahead. I've got a whole presentation so you guys see exactly what's happening in West Central. Bear with me just a moment. And sharing the screen. All right, excellent. Well, so good to be here. Thank you so very much for having me. Uh, it is good to be back. Uh, the, the running joke this year, don't call it a comeback because we've never left. Uh, but it is good to be back to meeting in person with West Central Neighborhood Council. Uh, our organization got really good with Zoom over the last year or two. And starting this year, we've also resumed meeting in hybrid. One big thing that we discovered during the pandemic is the importance of accessibility in our neighborhood. And thanks to the West Central Community Center and uh, our new neighbor, Randy McGlenn, who has a nifty device called a, an OWL Pro, the 360 degree camera, um, that's empowered us to hold our meetings fully hybrid. And what that means for our neighborhood is that our, our neighbors who are sick or disabled or have small children have all been able to attend and continue to take part in what we're doing, even when they aren't, don't always have access to show up in person. So since going back to hybrid, we've had the chance to talk to the Spokane County Assessor's Office, Habitat for Humanity, um, Chauncey Jones over at A Better Way. We've had the Water Department. Um, people can present to us digitally, remotely, or they can show up in person and build communities. So it's a, a real pleasure to be back. And we also had our uh, return to the neighborhood cleanup in-person events as well. And a big thank you to the community assembly for this and, and to the city for the return of these events. I know the uh, appetite lately has been really for going to those digital dump passes for the neighborhood or, excuse me, disposal passes. I've been corrected on that enough times. Uh, but the truth is that in neighborhoods like ours that are working class and don't always have access to drive all the way out to the disposal center. Having the option to come right to our local community center has been an enormous help. So thank you to everyone involved in making that happen this year. Uh, our community triangles and green spaces have been a challenge during the pandemic. And honestly, we, we had to get creative. Um, we formed some community partnerships. We had what we call weed and feed events. So we would have a little cleanup and a little luncheon. Um, anything we could do to get a whole lot of helping hands. I, I'm sure everyone at the city knows how difficult it is to get more people right now. Um, so we owe a big, big, big thanks to all of our volunteers in the neighborhood. We also had students at Whitworth University's Dornsife Center for Community Engagement, uh, the Garden Church as well, all helped us keep these corners of our neighborhood maintained with pride. So thank you to everybody and uh, certainly look forward to continuing those partnerships. And speaking of Pride, uh, some really big things have been happening in the West Central neighborhood thanks to Habitat for Humanity. Uh, their derelict housing rehab program is still going strong in West Central, and honestly, we couldn't be more thrilled. Uh, this photo actually is us welcoming our new neighbor, Farad, in December. Um, and this was actually the sixth zombie home that Habitat has rehabbed in West Central since 2019. When I say zombie home, what I mean is that these were derelict, damaged, abandoned homes. Uh, this particular house was actually a drug house and part of the nuisance abatement process. Um, and when I say six homes, that doesn't sound like a lot in comparison to you know, a national housing shortage. But the truth is that is enormous for all of the families impacted and also the families around these homes. Um, because these were a nexus of crime in the neighborhood. They were dragging the entire block down but with this spark, Habitat really is pulling whole blocks back right from the brink. I mean, we're seeing renewed investment, not just in these homes, but also the homes in the neighborhoods around them. We also had a, a few proud moments as well with the return of Neighbor Day, uh, again in 2022, back in person. A big thanks to the West Central Community Center, uh, Cops West, all of the friends and neighbors and everyone who really contributed to this amazing event and, and to the for capturing the, the rainy weather that day. Um, we also had Reach West Center, we, Reach West Central handing out uh, air purifiers that were built, also sponsored with the West Central Neighborhood Council. So just a really great opportunity to get out there, get to know each other and connect families and community members with resources that they need and 
arts and really just engage with one another. Uh, engaging the community is what we're all about, and the West Quadrant TIF has been a big point of action for us this year. I, I, uh, I promise I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of tax increment financing. I am very excited about it. Um, some of you have already heard me talk about this before. For anyone who doesn't know what a tax increment finance fund is, this really is huge for West Central because this is an opportunity to reinvest those financial gains from the tax base increase in Kendall Yards to create private investment in the surrounding neighborhood. And with that, it's helping us invest in our infrastructure, combat gentrification, and improve access to things like multimodal transportation, affordable housing, so many opportunities with this. Uh, this spring, the Neighborhood Council and our neighbors at REACH West Central collaborated to submit a funding request to the Neighborhood Project Advisor, Advisory Committee, and they passed that funding request unanimously. Um, with that request, the neighborhood identified all four of these projects as being the most urgent projects. Um, these, these have all been on the TIF project list for 14 years. Um, some of them actually are from the original Neighborhood Action Plan. Uh, they've been there since 1986. Uh, so that's, you know, 36 years to make really good and sure that this is the stuff that we want, this right here. Um, unfortunately, the holdup has been a lack of comprehensive implementation planning that has prevented us from taking action on any of these projects in the last 36 years. But really, I have to say, we need implementation planning and funding for that. Not more visioning or sub-area plans, please. Now's the time to act. Uh, our neighborhood has worked so hard to build a great community vision, we're ready to start building more than dreams right now. So we're asking your support to please keep the neighborhood in the driver's seat on this. And if any opportunity you have to encourage city staff, please plan with the neighborhood, not for the neighborhood. We're here to work with you. True growth happens from the ground up, so let's empower the community together. Let's end this historic divestment that has plagued this thriving urban neighborhood for so long. And speaking of thriving urban neighborhoods, I have to say West Central really is a community in motion. There has been so much happening this year as the world sort of comes back to life, uh, even as we're continuing to work, our, work through our new normal with the pandemic. Um, thank you to the community assembly. We had uh, our movie night event with Toy Story there at AM Cannon Park. Um, as you can see, we've got some Toy Story fans here because, y'all, the Bloomies are back. It's been wonderful to see uh, that part of the neighborhood come back to life. We also had uh, projects with the West Central Development Project and Cops West. They collaborated to do possibly the biggest national night out event we've seen yet. They had food trucks and a concert and a car show and, and lots of activity happening. So really, West Central is growing and thriving, and we're ready to do great things. So just in closing, I want to take a moment to say a few thank yous. Uh, certainly, we owe quite a lot of thanks to the hard work that's gone into this neighborhood. Um, thank you, as always, to the Northside Streets crew for being the fastest pothole filling team in town. Um, thank you, as well, to the city and to the council just for prioritizing those much-needed repairs on Boone and Broadway. Uh, we certainly have more to go, but thank you for getting her started. Um, also, thank you to the Community Assembly for the Community Engagement Grant and also for the Zoom sponsorship, without which our hybrid meetings couldn't happen. Thank you also to the Council for making time to hear this presentation tonight and all the other neighborhoods. West Central is doing great things in our city, and we're get, just getting started, so thank you for your support. Thank you so much, Liz, for presenting. Any questions for Liz from anyone or any comments? All right. Thank you, Liz. We yep. appreciate you. Yep. Thanks for the enthusiasm you. and your leadership. Okay, that I believe brings us to our consent agenda. And uh, Ms. Fister, if you'd like to read that, uh, minus item six, which we're taking separately. We have one appointment. Do you want oh, to start with that one? Oh, let's do the appointment. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Appointment of Livia Coe to serve in the youth position on the Spokane Human Rights Commission for a one-year term expiring on September 1, 2023. All right. All those in favor of appointing her, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? <coughs> Any abstentions? All right. Congratulations. And if you'd like to serve on a board or commission for the city, you can go to our website at City of Spokane Boards and Commissions. They list all the commissions, what they do, uh, what vacancies we have, and what the terms are of people that will uh, soon create vacancies. 
And for almost all of them, you apply to the mayor's office and the mayor uh, goes through them and interviews folks. And then once she nominates people, they come to us and we interview them. And um, so please look into that if you're interested. All right, now consent agenda minus item six. Okay. Reports, contracts, and claims. Number one, contract renewal 202 with Rubicon Global LLC, Atlanta, Georgia, for solid waste collections management and telematics system for solid waste collection and street vehicles from October 1, 2022 through September 30, 2023, $189,092.11. Number two, contract extension with Asset Works Wayne, Pennsylvania, for annual maintenance and support of the city's fleet asset management system from October 1, 2022 through September 30, 2023,101,433.69, including tax. Item number three, purchase of property casualty, ter terrorism and cyber insurance from Willis Towers, Watson Insurance, Seattle, Washington, for the city for the period of September 1, 2022 to August 31, 2023, $4,368,894. Number four, report of the mayor of Penny Nate claims and payments of previously approved obligations, including those of parks and library through August 19, 2022. Total $7,780,962.98 with Parks and Library claims approved by the respective boards. Warrants excluding Parks and Library, total $7,192,005.31. B, payroll claims of previously approved obligations through August 20, 2022, $8,134,529.25. Item number five, City Council meeting minutes for August 15, 2022. All right, we've got three members of the public, and even though a couple of them are indicating they're gonna testify about item six, I'm gonna have you all come up. And before I do, uh, just a reminder for those of you who aren't familiar with our council rules, uh, we did the applauding on the proclamations and poetry, but on council testimony, we don't do um, applause, we don't do cheers, we don't do boos. We just create a safe space that doesn't cause a disruption. Ask you to direct your comments to me as the meeting chair. Um, please don't denigrate any individual person. Um, and no sign displaying. You can have buttons and T-shirts. Uh, and you'll have up to three minutes. This light here will go yellow when you have a one minute left and then red when your time is up and I'll ask you to finish. Uh, with that, we've got Teresa Simon. After Teresa is Andrew Rolls and then Caleb Karchner. And Andrew and Caleb, you can come up. We've got two seats right here to get ready. Uh, but Teresa, I thought I saw you earlier, but I am not seeing. Teresa Simon? All right, Andrew, why don't you come up? Uh, well, good evening, Council President Beggs, members of Council. Thank you for the opportunity tonight to speak on the uh, shelter operator agreement. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I'm, I am here to offer some comments in support of passage of the agreement for the East Trent Shelter. Uh, we all recognize the urgency needed to provide supportive solutions and shelter to address encampments that pose a significant risk to everyone in the community. Uh, we appreciate yours and the administration's uh, leadership uh, and this unique public-private model that will establish the shelter on East Trent Shel uh, Avenue in the very near future pending passage of the agreement. Uh, this facility will provide a crucial first step on the path toward permanent housing for some of our most vulnerable. Uh, as you know, sidewalks, alleyways, and underpasses are not safe places for people to reside uh, who are struggling with behavioral health, addiction, and other challenges. Downtown residents and businesses, our employees and customers see this struggle firsthand and are all too familiar with the overwhelming issues that follow. Encampments create health and safety hazards, and our neighborhoods need your help. We need shelter and policies that address encampments, in particular in downtown, where critical infrastructure, hospitality activities, and a high concentration of pedestrians require additional tools. You can help those who are most vulnerable in our society and ensure the health and safety of everyone in our community by continuing the forward progress of the East Trent Shelter. Again, we thank you for bringing this to a vote tonight. We urge your support for the operator agreement and look forward to continuing uh, to partner with you on comprehensive solutions. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Andrew. Uh, Caleb Karchner, if you want to come up. Um, hello, my Hi. name is Caleb Karchner. Um, I'm a college student. Um, last year I came back and helped the homelessness move. Um, and I just wanted to talk about the new funding plan. Um, from what I've read, it's about $6.5 million of funding. I even heard up to $8.5 million. Um, 
that leaves about $2,400 a month per person. Um, and if those higher numbers are correct, it's like 3,000 a person per month. Um, and that doesn't include kitchens or showers or really any like place to stay really. It's not more of an emergency shelter. Um, so I was wondering if we could get something that's more sustainable. Um, it may be a competitive bid that makes so the price isn't so high. Um, my housing, at least in other places I've seen is like 900 a month that includes kitchens and showers and a nice place to live. Um, so yeah, if we could, the, the cost just seems pretty high, so. Um, that is it, thank you. Thanks, Caleb. And Teresa, we called you, but come on up. We're talking about the consent agenda. Um, and you've got up to three minutes if you wanna come up. Sure, it's all the contracts that we do, the whole group of them that we do at once usually, and also including the operation agreement for the Trent shelter. I think that there are things that need to be taken care of at the Trent agenda, and I think you need to pay for some of them. I think there's services that need to be done there, and there's, thing, there's people that actually need to be there. So use your money wisely because you're using mine. I'm sorry you didn't buy the building. It was a good investment, even if I didn't like the whole program of the building. Thanks for coming down. All right, so the first five items, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? All right, they're approved. And now, um, Ms. Fister, if you would read item six, and we'll take any council commentary there is on that. Shelter operator agreement with the Guardians Foundation Spokane for daily operations of the Trent Avenue shelter from August 29, 2022 through December 31, 2023, $6,581,731. All right, before we have council commentary, uh, John Hall is here and he said he would get back to us on the, which isn't the operator agreement, but the proposal for providing services uh, what those are going to be, and any other questions? We also have Johnny Perkins here and Tanya Wallace for other council questions. So let's do council questions first, and then we'll do commentary. Welcome, John. Hi, thank you, Council President Beggs. Do you I was want just looking at a summary of what the okay. services RFP is proposing as, as negotiated by you all. Well, the negotiations are ongoing, but the proposal that was submitted, we received one proposal uh, from Revive. Uh, the family of organizations are, is Revive Center for Returning Citizens, Revive Counseling in Spokane, Revive Reentry Services. So the gist of, of their proposal covers five uh, pillars that focus on integrated reentry models. Uh, they are peer support, um, they have staff, work as peers who will walk side by side with individuals to navigate them through a continuum of housing, employment, health and social service activities. The second pillar is behavioral health services. Uh, there's an integrated trauma-informed person-centered behavioral health treatment provided by master level clinicians licensed by the Department of Health. And for them, it's about identifying and treating mental disease and creating and maintaining mental health and well-being. Then there is a wraparound case management and case care coordination. Uh, these consist of case managers, the peer support specialists, the clinical therapists. Uh, again, they provide the navigating uh, support um, for barriers that are traditionally with housing and employment opportunities, the mental care system social service systems and court and probation services. The fourth one is supported employment services. For the past four years, Reentry has um, built their, their network to utilize evidence-based model for ind individual place and supports. Uh, and they have developed a pipeline of opportunities for their participants seeking job growth, higher education, internships, certifications, and long-term careers. And the fifth one is based on permanent supportive housing um, to help the clients obtain funding sources, housing vouchers, subsidies, and affordable housing opportunities. 
that is an overview of, of what the activities are proposed to be. Again, the, the proposal was for three million. We are in process of negotiating for about half of that. Of their three million budget, two thirds of that was for salaries and benefits. Uh, the second and third line items uh, were basically for 300,000 for direct client assistance. And then there's a, a line item for indirect charges of 10%, which equates to 274,000. So we'll, we'll be in negotiation with, with the respondent to, to, to come up with a, a budget for the 1.5 million. Any other questions for Mr. Hall? Uh, Councilmember Stratton. And you may not have had a chance to get an answer to this. I just wanted to know, do they have a, what's their background with working with groups of this size? That I have not seen in, in this uh, synopsis. Uh, they have been in existence since 2013, um, and they say they are fully prepared to, um, to take care of 150 to 250 person population. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Hall, my question was, and you probably don't know this, but are they gonna be able to bill for fee services? Because that would, in my opinion, would certainly impact the cost Many of those people will qualify through DSHS or Apple Health, mm -hmm. uh, especially with those master level clinicians, how that would impact that cost going forward. That is that something I would have to look into. The, the, the budget that they have did not provide a narrative. It's just mm -hmm. a chart with the, with the line items. Right, and to, to put a point on that, so some of those services would be covered. And so the question is, does right. that money come back to the city or does it go to them? That's, exactly. that's your question. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Councilmember Kinnear. What's your timeline? So if we approve this tonight, when will we actually see people in the facility? So if you approve it tonight, you will actually see people uh, in the facility within seven days from today. So I would basically say next Monday is Labor Day. So basically the day after Labor Day. Okay, thank you. Good. So without a service provider, who, who will be helping these people relocate? So for, without a service provider, we, we intend to have the service provider contract to you guys probably within the next week or two, uh, I guess the, the Tuesday after Labor Day. Uh, and so that will run closely behind it and, and what Reentry or revive is, is saying for their startup is that it will take them up to four months to get fully uh, up and running. Onboarding and training process for new staff will occur gradually over the first four months of contracting on the service provider side. But until that time, we would have the Guardians Foundation uh, working uh, to do uh, to intake um, the the recipients. Okay. And. If you know, so we talked today about the operations contract and the guardians, mm -hmm. and the, their, their contract was going to be a reimbursement contract as opposed to a per capita type of contract. Is that the same with services? It's a reimbursement contract? That would be probably the assumption that the contract hasn't been put together, but if, if, if you guys have ideas on other types of contract, and we, we're definitely receptive. Mm -hmm. okay. Go ahead. All right, um, I was just wondering. Transit is not included in any of these costs, right? That would be an additional cost later working with STA? Yes. Okay. And is that part of the difference from the original contract that was running about $8 million, now we're down to $6 million? Um, what, what's, the, what's the variance um, that came about in the Guardian's contract? Uh, the major variance is just the timing of the opening. So we, I think we originally anticipated the, the shelter to open in July and then the 1st of August, now the, basically the 1st of September. So the, the, the monthly cost has come down, uh, I think, by like $500,000. Uh, so that's been the major variance. Uh, Council Member oh, I was just going to follow up. Do we have any ballpark idea of what transit would cost? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, that was in the original proposal. It was uh, what staff says is below the line. Uh, I can't remember that exact number at the moment. I don't know if um, Ms. Wallace, do you know the, the number for the transit? Um, for some reason, 200 ish. Is that's what I was thinking. I didn't want to throw out a number, but that's probably it then if, if you're thinking it and I'm thinking it. But that is not um, 
budgeted. Right. Uh, that was b below that line on the table, on the chart. So then you would anticipate the transit being part of the service provider contract, or that would be, because they're going to be uh, connecting them. That's that $300,000 for other services that you, one of the pillars that you spoke to. Do, would we anticipate that coming from that particular pillar? So in the, the service provider proposal for travel, they have 93,600 listed for their line item. And then in the interim, we have the Guardians Foundation that, that will be providing basically shuttle services for, for the clients, not the, the, the uh, bus service. Any more questions for Mr. Hall? We also have Tanya Wallace and Johnny Perkins if anyone has questions for them. Just, just sorry. Yeah. Keep just going. an observation. Um, Mr. Perkins did send us some pictures today of the shelter. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. Um, I didn't see, it must be on the outside, uh, bathroom amenities, but I have to comment that three quarter wall would only come a little bit above my waist. And if I was a female and had to stand up and was changing or taking my clothes off to go to bed or whatever I might be doing legally, um, there really does not provide any privacy. So we were just thinking the walls could be at some point higher. I know we want a line of sight in that building uh, because that provides a level of safety, but there also has to be a level where uh, the people do feel safe. I shared today that I received a referral, someone who had been assessed um, through DSHS, and he was very adamant, his quote, that he would not go to a shelter because he doesn't feel safe. He would rather be homeless than to be in a shelter, which was a pretty sad statement. Um, because he had just been robbed, he had nothing. But he said he'd rather be on the street than to be in a shelter. So how we change that narrative or what the guardians will be doing for outreach, I think will be critical um, because there is that perception, and it's not just housing, it's the perception we have to deal with where people want to live and be safe as we go forward. And for $6,500,000, 6, I want them to feel like they can be safe there and would utilize that space. Otherwise, is this the wisest and best use of our money? And just a, a, a response to the change in area. So there will be dedicated space that the Guardians Foundation will have for, for changing. Okay. Uh, so the clients will not have to change in, in their uh, partitions. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Councilman Ringel. And safety is an important concern in this um, in this scenario. And so I know that we've addressed security in um, in a couple ways. Can you speak to that a little bit on the the security that's going to be on site and and around the facility? Yes. Uh, so in the uh, part of the the scope of services in the exhibit B, it, it outlines that the security will occur twelve hours a day. Um, and then we will have um, the ambassador program, which I believe is 24 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those two will, will be providing the security for, for the site and the neighboring area for, for the, um, the immediate, I think, a two-block radius. Okay. Um, and, and on that, uh, I believe we have on-site security, security outside, as well as a police presence. Is that correct? Yes, there will be, for the first 30 days, there will be police presence working overtime to ensure that um, the, the launching or the opening of the shelter is, is done with, with seamless service and, and with little disruption to the community. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So I have a question for all, all three of you. I had a text from somebody who's watching that said they thought Revive had dropped out of negotiations. Is there any hint of that that you've heard of? Not to, to my understanding. There was a meeting Thursday of the CHHS board, uh, and so staff had been in touch with Revive, and as I understand it today, um, they, you know, they submitted for $3 million 
um, but they would agree to, to enter into negotiations for 1.5 million. Okay, all right. All right, I think you can sit down. Thank you so all much right. for being Thank here you. and answering those questions. Um, council commentary on item six, shelter operator agreement. All right. Oh, go, go ahead. If you're, yeah. I, I guess I just wanted to shout out Mr. Hall real quick because he jumped into the middle of a, of a situation that had numerous versions of a lot of things. And, uh, you know, I think he's done a great job coming in here and figuring out the things that were happening and, and all the different versions and, um, and uh, you know, doing what he can to keep us informed on that. So thank you, Mr. Hall. Yeah. Right. Any other comments? Council Member Zapone. Yeah, this has uh, been a tough one that I've been wrangling with all weekend. There's the issues uh, of need. We know there's a lot of need in our community and we need to do something quickly and we need to do it now. Uh, but there's also really big concerns that I have, the other council members and community members have. There's uh, the ongoing costs and how are we gonna continue to fund this? That's a, uh, a deep concern. Uh, I appreciate Mr. Hall talking to me late Friday and um, pointing out some grant options that I think are potential. We've talked about potentially commerce funding being helping uh, think we might have to seriously talk as a community about our investment as a community in the city and maybe the county about uh, home funding homelessness. Maybe that's a homelessness levy and a public safety levy. And that's something that we could talk about in the next year. So I think of this uh, opening the trend for the next 16 months as kind of a pilot program. We can see is it going to be used because that's the, the other issues. Will people actually use it? Um, I've, I've had some doubts and concerns, but if and when, hopefully, one time this opens up, um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. So despite all the differences in opinion about the Trent Shelter, I hope that it will be successful when it opens. And in the spirit of uh, solidarity and the hope that this shelter is successful, I'm inviting the mayor to stay the night at the shelter for three nights with me and Zeke Smith from Empire Health Foundation and Chris Patterson from Hello for Good. Chris and Zeke have already agreed to this, so I'm extending the invitation to the mayor. Uh, the four of us would show uh, that community leaders across the political spectrum and professional backgrounds are committed to the success of this shelter. So, of course, if the shelter's at capacity and there are no beds available, we wouldn't stay the night there. We don't want to take precious beds away from people who need it. Uh, but I do understand there are a bunch of mats available and that it has flex space too. So I think that we could do that. And so look forward to hearing from the mayor and from uh, Mr. Hall about when it opens. Councilmember Wilkerson. I think those four mats could be considered surge capacity. But that being said, uh, I also want to thank Mr. Hall for coming in and just, it was a hot mess and it's still kind of a hot mess. This is like a house of cards. One thing has to fall, or dominoes. One has to fall before all the other options of how we meet the needs of our homeless and unhoused people. This contract is through December 2023. I want to let people know there is no money after 2023. So sustainability is critical of what we do after 2023. I cannot, uh, as finance chair, say that enough and keep that before the community and the administration. We've had these conversations. Uh, it's the cliff. We're calling it the cliff. What will we do then after December 2023? Till the shelter hope opens, I hope other opportunities open. I hope Commerce steps in and do all that they have promised to do. Uh, with Mr. Zapone, we may need to look at some type of levy or tax. Uh, it's just what our citizens are willing to pay for and how important it is to us as a community, how we treat our sisters and brothers going forward. I've been on the fence all weekend, so I want to hear what my other council members have to say. Council Member Kinnear, you're next. Yes, I didn't even raise my hand. I just look at him and he goes, it's you. So um, I haven't been on the fence. I think this is really important to go forward. We have people who have no place to go and winter's coming as it does every year. In all good conscience, we can't turn this down. And I know there is a cliff, and I have faith that we are gonna find other monies because we've talked about how we can go through the steps to get that other money. So I have confidence in our staff 
who have brokered this agreement, this deal. Um, we don't know how it's going to be used. And as Mr. Sapone said, this in many ways is a pilot. Let's see how it's used, if it's used, how many people, what, it's, what needs to happen in addition to what we've provided. We're gonna learn what people actually need there. And we're gonna learn the success of people who may come into that shelter and leave for something more positive. So I, I'm anxious to see how that all works out. I want, I want to see how this happens. And I'm confident that we as a city, and I'm hoping eventually as a region, so it's not the city of Spokane going it alone, as a region, we can combat homelessness and make this a success. So Councilmember Wilkerson, join me in supporting this because I think there's a path forward and I think we can do this if we do it together. There is an out clause in the contract. Always the optimist. <laughs> Other council commentary? Go ahead, Councilman Ringo. All right. I will just say this has been a, a, a really long process, and, and through it all, I just um, appreciate the efforts uh, of the administration to find a way to make something work. Um, we demand. Uh, you know, specifically of the mayor, uh, you know, every month it feels like we're, we're chiding her and the administration for not following through with the, um, uh, with the ordinances that we've passed. And so it feels as if as a council, um, not that we have to support this one, obviously, because uh, there, are, there are concerns with it, but it feels as if it is the, the right step to take forward to empower the mayor and the administration to do the things that we demand of them to do. It's hard to... Um, uh, you know, as uh, Bill Parcells said, that if we're going to demand that uh, that they cook the meals, we should at least allow them to help with the groceries. And so we need to uh, we need to empower them to do the right thing that, that we've asked them to do. And so I appreciate all of their efforts, um, and I, I think that this is going to be a good step forward for the community, um, for people who are wanting to exit homelessness, uh, creating a step in the ladder to get out. I think is really important, and I think this does that really well. Um, uh, I think that there has been a lot of private dollars that have come in specifically because they care so deeply about this city and about uh, the folks in crisis. And um, I don't think they get enough credit either for, for stepping up to the plate to give up their own money and their own time and their own efforts to hire folks to be focusing on community solutions and what's the way that we can best address uh, people in crisis. And so um, I would like to thank the numerous uh, you know homeless providers as well who have stepped up. And there's been a lot of collaboration behind the scenes from uh, you know, all, all across the spectrum, and I think they've done uh, a really good job to try and bring something together. And so um, I appreciate all their efforts. I intend to support this tonight, and uh, I hope that it is um, one of the steps forward. Uh, you know, there's, there's really three things that we need um, in the city of Spokane when it comes to homelessness. Uh, one of them is, is shelter space. This is that. Um, we need um, significant investments in mental health and addiction services. Um, and the last thing that we need to be able to do is we need to be able to regulate the public space. And so uh, while we're stepping up, there is no doubt that there's a cliff that's coming uh, when it comes to funding. Um, and the state currently is experiencing a surplus, and I would just ask the state to uh, consider consider funding services like this and programs like this so that the burden doesn't continue to fall on municipalities to fund these services that are desperately needed in their, uh, in their municipalities. And so um, as the state experiences that, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing significant investments in uh, shelter operation dollars, shelter uh, you know, capital dollars, um, and funding for mental health and addiction services. And so I look forward to the day that we get to share those with, with the city of Spokane as well. Absolutely. Can I just make one more money comment? Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I, we, this is needed. I'm in the business. Yeah. So between September and December 2023, if we do not negotiate down the revived contract, this will be $9 million or over $9 million for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. So I just want you all just to add it up. My personal frustration with the administration has back in June, I asked them for the total package and I have consistently asked for the total package. What's this gonna cost for the provider? What's it gonna cost for services? So we could really budget that. And I know there has been uh, roadblocks and hiccups, 
So it's been a very piecemeal approach uh, from my position on council as to the numbers have been somewhat fluid. They have changed over a period of time. And again, yes, we do need it. Our people need somewhere to go. But I want you guys to hear clearly, this could be a $9 million um, pilot yeah. to see what's going on in our city. Not saying we don't need it, but please just bear that in mind. Any other commentary? All right, well, I'll just speak in support of it. I'm gonna vote for it tonight. Um, I thought for a while that we needed a place that had surge capacity for smoke events, for cold events, for heat events, and this will get it. Um, we should have done this a year ago, and it wasn't that the city council demanded it, the community demanded it. They said, you, you need to do this. And based on those demands from the community, we passed a law and said, you can't close shelter beds without replacing them, and you need to provide plans for cold and heat and smoke, and uh, we're just a year too late. And frankly, we wouldn't have had Camp Hope if we had done this on time uh, under the law and not closed the one uh, shelter without having this in place. Um, that said, I think uh, both the administration and the business community have come to a new understanding of the need for a low barrier shelter and why it fits in with a long-term plan of ending homelessness. And I want to commend everyone in the administration and the staff that have worked so hard to get where we are. I know from hearing people in the community that this location, this building, the operator, it's not ideal for some people, but it is what we have, and it is a game changer. It really is a game changer. It will really work if we invest the money for bathrooms and sleeping pods with a door for privacy. That's 2.0 low barrier shelter is a door for privacy. Everybody wants a door for privacy when they're changing, when they're sleeping. Uh, and we can do that affordably, actually. That would be a very small piece of the $9 million. We could do that. And some people are, don't want to give people that privacy uh, or the dignity of those bathrooms, but I think we need to do that. So we need to finish that job. And I'm hoping Commerce will help us with that. But even if it doesn't, we've got REIT funds that could be dedicated to that if we uh, update our capital improvement plan. So I am totally supportive of this and to make it work as best we can. I think it will be a game changer. I agree with folks that after about a year, we should put out another RFP and see if we can get it for cheaper and you know, use the lessons that we've learned over that time uh, with both our staff and the contractor staff. Um, but I just think we, this is an important step forward. It fills a big gap in our community that we just haven't had. So I really appreciate everyone coming together uh, to do that. And with that, it's a voice vote on the consent item. So all those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? nay? Nay. All right, so that's five to two. That passes. And we'll look forward to that opening uh, next Tuesday and hopefully a services contract not too long after that. And no, it doesn't, it doesn't go up there. It's a voice, voice vote. Um, so next is a special budget ordinance. Ordinance C36261, amending ordinance number C36161, passed by the City Council December 13, 2021, and entitled an ordinance adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2022, making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2022, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage and declared an emergency and appropriating funds in American Rescue Plan Fund, number one, increase appropriation by $160,000 funded from the city's direct allocation of the state and local fiscal recovery fund of the American Rescue Plan Act. This ARP fund appropriation qualifies as part of the general government services program category. A, $160,000 of the appropriation is provided solely for the replacement of playground equipment to be purchased through the Parks Department. This action arises from the need to provide appropriation for parks playground equipment. And just as a headline on this, this isn't really changing anything. It's more of just a technical fix on language, making sure that the money comes from the proper account. Uh, but we do have Teresa Simon who signed up if you want to testify. She's waiving that. Any council commentary? Prepare to vote. All right, that passes seven to zero. 
don't have any emergency resolutions, but we do have a resolution about the East Sprague parking and business improvement area. Did you want to take care of the ordinance 36239? Uh, I think we should, actually, okay. now that you, you mentioned that. Okay. So, uh, so just as, again, a little bit of a background, we voted on this ordinance last week. Um, but we um, considered and accepted an amendment, a oral amendment from the dais, and our rules say that we can't do that unless we suspend the rules, and we did not suspend the rules, and so what our rules say is that it automatically goes to the next council meeting for a revote. and uh, earlier today, there was a written amendment um, uh, that reflected the oral uh, amendment last week, and at briefing session, council adopted that amendment. So we now have the amended version that uh, complied with the rules. Uh, but now if you want to read the title. Okay. Ordinance C36239, determining the process and criteria for citing basic city facilities, amending section 12.05.005 and enacting new sections 12.05.062 and 12.05.063 of the Spokane Municipal Code and declaring an emergency. We had extensive public comment last week, but nobody signed up this week. Is there any further council commentary? All right, then prepare to vote. All right, that passes five to two. And now we're on the resolutions. Resolution 2022-0076, declaring the intention of City Council to change or establish certain assessment rates within the East Break Parking and Business Improvement Area and setting hearing for September 19, 2022. All right, and we have uh, one person signed up to testify, and that's Teresa Simon. I have no idea what the resolution says, but I do want to tell you that when they put up the parking signs down East Sprague, they stuck them behind poles, telephone poles. And they should spend whatever money they got here to go move the signs out in front while they're busy ticketing people who don't see the signs because they're behind the pole. And I had to go to court on it. And I don't know why the parking people didn't want to show up, probably because I'm obnoxious but they should spend part of the parking money resolution to get the new construction and the signs out from behind the light poles so you can actually park accordingly. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, any council commentary? All right, prepare to vote. All right, that passes seven to zero. Resolution 2022-78, approving settlement of Tina Lee versus City of Spokane, Spokane County Superior Court cause number 20-2-02838-32, arising out of an incident occurring on April 12, 2019, $80,000. All right, we have two uh, Community members who want to test, who signed up to testify. Teresa Simon is first, and then Chris Schuler. Can somebody tell us what the city got sued for that we're paying for? It's a car accident. So that's about all I recall from it. Thank you. All right, Chris. Good to see you again. Welcome back. I'm not sure that I believe you, Mr. Bags. I got attacked a bunch, and I'm tired of being attacked for coming here. I have the right to come here. Anyway, I'm t I, uh, uh, regarding this resolution, it says, she asked that it's, and you answer that it's about a car wreck, that you think it's about a car wreck. And that's what I was gonna ask is, you, you have this resolution and you have people signed up if they wanna support it or oppose it, but there's no details to find out what it's about. 
And so it's very difficult for somebody to oppose it or support it without actually knowing the facts or the details. And it's very hard to, to look it up. And so, so that should be more transparent. Because when I saw this, I'm thinking $80,000 What's that for, a cold shoulder? Is that the new going rate for a cold shoulder? Because it didn't say, and a person has to guess, and nobody should be voting on things that they're guessing for. They should know what it is. And so you should be more transparent about that. And also, I want to point out that this lady has a lawyer. It says Craig, Craig Swap, so you kind of think, hmm, maybe it's a car accident, but you don't know, you have to guess. And so I want to point out how when a person can afford a lawyer, that's how it works in this city. If a person can afford a lawyer, they get their rights. This says that you guys are uh, recommending that you're going to vote for it. And, but if this person could not afford a lawyer, they don't get their rights. That's how it works. They know, and, and you should know that, AutoZem. If a person can afford a lawyer, they get their rights. If a person cannot afford a lawyer, lots of bad things happen to them again and again. They're abused and abused, and, they, and, and cops get away with it. Taxpayer-funded workers get away with it. Why? Because the, the victim cannot afford a lawyer. And so I think that you should really work on that. Whether a person can afford a lawyer or not, they should still get their rights. And I'm glad to hear that this is not $80,000 for a cold shoulder. Thanks for coming down, Chris. Any council commentary? All right, prepare to vote. All right, that passes seven to zero. And that brings us to first reading ordinances. Ordinance C36262, amending the Spokane Fair Elections Code to reduce redundancies and duplication within state law, amending sections 1.07.005, 1.07.030, and 1.07.070, and repealing sections 1.07.080 and 1.07.100 of the Spokane Municipal Code. Further action is deferred on the first reading ordinance. Council Member Zappone, do you want to just tee that up? Yeah, so this uh, ordinance would... Um clean up some of the language in the municipal election code and uh, one the biggest change is that it would increase the uh, contribution limit from $500 to $1,000 and uh, that makes it uh, similar to the PDC regulation statewide. Uh, Spokane has cut in half uh, and that has, over the last few years, we've seen an increase in independent expenditures in campaigns. So um, it has not limited money from being in local elections but rather given that money or that money has been redirected to independent expenditures outside parties who are influencing our campaigns. So this would just bring it back up to state code and give uh, campaigns um, more ability to um, compete with independent expenditures and in influencing um, and campaigning. All right. Thanks. We have uh, two committee members signed up, Teresa Simon, and after Teresa, Chris Shula. Teresa is waving. Chris, do you want to testify? Hello again. This one I support because it's a badly written law when I was looking at it, the Spokane Code, and that you passed this in 2018. And it was very badly written. And badly written laws should not exist. They should just be repealed. And it says it's going to repeal the, the two of them, number, the Spokane code that ends with 80 and the one that ends with 100, those are just going to be repealed at all, um, completely. And that's really good to repeal all badly written laws and, and have them, what he, what he said, matching the state instead of trying to override the state. I've been here many times talking about how there's a, a state constitution and RCWs, and you guys can't override that. You're supposed to follow it. And the same with the United States Constitution and, and laws, you know, you're supposed to follow it and you can't write these badly written laws that, that conflict or contradict with the other laws you're supposed to follow. So I do support this. And any other badly written laws that you have, you should repeal them too. All right, thanks for coming down. Any council commentary? Oh, there is no council commentary, it's just first reading. So we're not voting. Thanks. All right. 
That brings us to open forum. And I was going to call on Susan Harbury, I believe, or Harvey. And after Susan is uh, Teresa Simon, and then Stu Lee. And feel free to come on down to one of these seats near the front so we can maximize. You can come right up to the podium, but we can maximize talking and not so much walking. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me here. My name is Susan Hardy. I'm a re uh, the captain of the Neighborhood Watch um, for Palisades and also a retired Air Force nurse. And um, I'm here to, to share with you some of the concerns that we're having. We've had increasing crime. It's been getting exponentially worse over the last few years. Uh, we just, uh, there was a, st a structure that was found, I have pictures of it, that, uh, that just a few days ago, right below, um, right in Indian Canyon um, Park, that uh, it's a pretty good solid structure, and that was, that's in the process of being disassembled. Um, before I went into nursing, I, I took two years of human services. I, I really have a heart for people. I, I love people and and all their different situations that they find themselves in. You know, we are just, <laughs> you never know what, what life will bring at us. Um, when, I, when I worked downtown San Diego in the emergency room, we had homeless individuals that would come in and we had staff, we had police that would put these homeless people up at their own expense just to get them off the street in monthly housing that was very safe. And within days, they were back on the street because that is their preference. It's a real hard situation for everybody. And my concern, my the bottom line, my concern is for everybody and that no one gets hurt. And yesterday, or a few days ago, I wrote this to the Neighborhood Watch. And I said, I'm sincerely concerned that someone is going to get hurt shot and killed, or one of our community residents will come to harm because those with behavioral health issues and, and the criminals, they have no boundaries. That's a fact. The authorities, our leaders, you are expecting us to be able to differentiate between who has a, a behavioral health issue and who is a criminal. We don't know. When I found someone in our house about a month ago, which I shared with you, um, the individual took two steps towards me before he turned and walked out the door. I'm standing here with shingles. I'm on my second round of antivirals trying to, to get that under control. I'm concerned that something is going to happen so I wrote the authorities in this, and our leaders are expecting us to figure out the difference between the mentally ill and the criminals, training that the majority of us do not have. If we have problems with the individuals on our properties, in our homes, on the street, we are being told to report back to the Susan, Catholic Charities Susan, or, yes, okay. We're, we're done with your time. Thanks okay, for coming thank down. Okay, thank you so much. I hope you feel better soon. This is a very con big concern, thank you. No, not, not in that one. I'm, I'm wait. Yeah, I haven't started you yet. Okay, so where's the mouse? You do need to come over to speak into the microphone, though. Okay, well, I don't know that I can click at the same time. There's, the, the mouse has a long cord. Okay. So I think what I want to cover... First thing I want to cover. Can you speak more into the mic? That, that yeah, mic. the first thing I want to cover. That well, that's not doing any good, so. Okay, you need to come back over to this mic. And you can bring the cord with the mouse. Can you uh, reset my time because I would like to use it? Sure. Thank you. Okay, so the first thing I want to cover is the first thing I want to cover. Okay, so I got an email from Jonathan Bingle after he approached me in the hallway. And I want to say a couple <laughs> things about the email. 
Um, when you've been raped, you don't really need to be raped again, and you don't really need to talk about your rape, and you don't need to relive your rape, and you don't need to go through two trials, and you don't need to go through four trials. And I've, by the way, been raped. So <clears throat> I didn't realize at four years old that I was raped, or five years old, or whatever it was, and I didn't realize when I was 16 or 17 or 18 that I was raped again. It took me a long time to figure that out. So what this is, is a dismissal from the city of Spokane for a wrongful arrest. And it says that they don't have the evidence, the information, or any proof that would stand up in trial that I did anything wrong at City Hall. That's the statement. It came from the Spokane County Prosecutor's Office. That's who dismissed it. It was Brian O'Brien. That's over. I'm a victim of City Hall. And I'm going to come down here every week and I'm going to talk about what preceded this. And I'm going to make everybody down here realize that Mary Marimatsu talked to my attorney and sent me to the cop shop. And I have audio tape from the cop shop that they were told not to help me down at the cop shop that I'm a bad person. And they locked me out of the cop shop and they trespassed me out there. They created $83,000 worth of damage to my property. They told me to protect myself because they weren't coming out anymore. I have a thousand police calls to my destroyed home that wouldn't have been destroyed. It was sold on a contract. It wouldn't have been destroyed if the city had taken care of the three chronic nuisance orders that they served and prosecuted the people who allowed it to go and quit going through the ombudsman's office to let this go. And if you think that Mary Marimatsu calling my attorney suggesting and suggesting to me that I might let them continue my property going from $113,000 to $30,000 in damage and continue to go another three months when I have a neighbor that's been assaulted eight times, eight times inside her house and outside her house and nobody is charged and I'm left out there with no cops. I have letters from the schools begging the police department Teresa, to stop. That's your three minutes for tonight. But Good. I'm coming back. Yep, we'll see you. I'm not your victim. Thanks. Mr. Bingo. All right. Stu Lee. And after Stu Lee is going to be Sandy Nickel. Nickel. And after that, William Hagee. <coughs> I'm a victim. Don't forget it. <clears throat> Just wait. We'll, we'll, you're fine. All right, Stu, welcome back to City Council. You've Thank got you. up to three minutes. Uh, I am here to speak to the Quality Inn Project, the planned pallet community, and other projects like the House of Charity that remain hidden behind closed doors. I am disappointed in this council and in my representatives. This council has chosen to destroy my neighborhood and the lifestyle of me and my neighbors without any input from the people whom you are sacrificing. Everyone in this room knows that wherever Camp Hope goes, there will be crime and vandalism following. Remember the attempt to use the Coliseum as a warming center last winter? $90,000 in damage in two weeks, and the program had to be stopped. We all wish we could offer help to the people of Camp Hope and that they would willingly accept that help and become productive members of our society. Our wish will go unsatisfied. Statistics and history show us that most of the residents of Camp Hope do not want to return to a normal, productive life. The majority have exhausted all attempts at help from family, friends, and established services. That is why they have come from all over the Northwest to live in Camp Hope. President Beggs, 
On August 11th, you said in an email to me, and I quote, the city is not the decision maker and doesn't have any active involvement in the funding operation of location of this project. May I remind you of your July 20th, 2022 letter to the Department of Commerce where you said, purchase and rehab a motel on the Sunset Highway. These two statements are at least a contradiction. From Nathan Pippen from the Department of Commerce, and I quote, the city of Spokane put forth a plan that included the purchase and repurposing of the Quality Inn with Catholic Charities as the owner operator of the property. So Commerce has asked for jurisdictions to partner with us in the undertaking of this work, but Commerce was not involved in the local decision making and about how that request was met. Councilwoman Kinnear, you and Councilwoman Wilkerson are my representatives. You are elected to represent the residents of District 2, not the residents of Camp Hope. Your responsibility is to the working people who pay the taxes and support the city and pay your salaries. In a recent email to me, you said, I cannot stand in the way, and the disconnect seems to be between Catholic Charities and the neighbors in this issue. How is it you have chosen to remove yourself from this process that will devastate your district and your constituents for decades to come? You should be pounding your fist on the desk and saying, no, not my district, not my people. The pain has already started. The strain of dealing with this event is too overwhelming for the chairperson of our neighborhood council, and she has resigned. I live in the Whittier Park area just down the hill from the Quality Inn and literally next door to the proposed pallet community, a unique neighborhood that seldom has a single home for sale. Today there are six homes for sale in my neighborhood because of this proposed plan. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Stu. Um, Sandy Nickel and then William Hagee and then Gib from back. Thank you. Uh, same topic, and I want to talk about West Hills, Charity House, Camp Hope, and Catholic Charities. Uh, West Hills, we've been blindsided with a proposition to have a shelter put in the, um, in the, in the motel up on Sunset Boulevard. Uh, nobody in our neighborhood wants it. Um, and we, were not, we weren't even asked anything about it. They just forced it down our throats, and that's what they want to do. Um, West Hills is, is a neighborhood. It's not downtown. And we've watched Charity House. Charity House, you guys, are, they've asked to move out, out of the downtown area. Why? Because it's an unsustainable debacle. And that's why you're having it moved. The, the, the building itself has a service. The outside collateral damage is horrific. And it's an un unsustainable debacle, and you want to move that up to, uh, up to uh, uh, Catholic Charities wants to move it up to the motel uh, at the Quality Inn. That's a neighborhood. So you're asking a neighborhood with residents who sleep there to put up with the same thing that you guys refuse to put up with anymore downtown. How is that? You know, talk about, you know, uh, that's just not right. It's just not right. I, uh, it's a low barrier shelter. There's no curfew. They're, the people are coming from Camp Hope. They didn't come to us. Catholic Charities didn't come to us and say, geez, you have a homeless problem. Can we help you? They didn't do that. They're taking people from Camp Hope and they're bringing them into our neighborhood, increasing our homeless problem. And nobody's ever even talked to us about this, all right? And in addition to that, according to Catholic Charities, not only are they bringing in 100 uh, homeless people, but they come with a, with a whole bunch of camp followers and an entourage of drug dealers and everything else that's gonna be coming into our residential neighborhood. I don't want to say, I don't think I have to say anymore. I think you can understand how the people in my neighborhood feel about it. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Uh, William Hagee, and then Gib Brumbach, and then Sherry Barnett. <coughs> Council President, thank you. Council members. Uh, I left some visual uh, talking points on your desk if you'd like to page through a few of those. Uh, I'm speaking on the behalf of the West Hills residents and uh, the surrounding areas that have been largely affected by homeless encampments 
including the two most recent fires. Uh, one is currently still under investigation. The second one that's been on the bluff there, uh, located on Coeur d'Alene Street off Sunset, just between the Cannon Street Shelter and the Sunset Bridge there. Um, it's largely concerning that the size of these fires seem to be rapidly increasing. And I do understand we have a large, considerable volume of homeless uh, throughout the community, community-wide, uh, as far past Minnehaha, Beacon Hill, uh, throughout the River Corridor, uh, Highbridge Park, all throughout these areas has become largely dangerous, lawless, with uh, just a tremendous amount of environmental damage. I understand that the uh, sit no lie uh, has been back and forth to uh, explore how to enforce that. I understand it's the shelter bed systems that are most important. And, uh, you know, there's been a considerable amount of testimony involving the Quality Inn project itself, as well as the tiny home pallet village there at Sunset in Government Way. And uh, I've had long conversations with uh, Chris Patterson from Hello for Good, and it's, it's highly... Uh, studied uh, by a professional study that bottlenecking and, and condensing services in one area may be of convenience, but it's, it's, it's definitely uh, causing an alarming rate of uh, public health and safety issues. Um, we've uh, found a body outside of the bathrooms at Fish Lake Trailhead, a uh, body turned up in the Lataw Creek area. Um, I just in between division and, and uh, government way, I pass approximately two and 300 on an average day. And so I really do hope that you all can come together and address this because it is a very, as you know, an important factor in public health and safety. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks, William. Uh, Gibb, and then Sherry Bar Barnett, and then Kimberly Hardy, <clears throat> or no, I already did Kimberly. No, Mr. I haven't President, done I have a map. Yeah. Uh, for, who do I give this to so you all can have it? You can give it to the clerk right here. Okay. This, what this is is a map of properties that may or may not be hey, developed you, in the near future. We need you to speak in the mic, so t repeat that into the <clears throat> mic. That would be great. The map is for you just so you're aware of the properties uh, that will and, and may not be developed in the near future. First of all, again, my name is Gib Brumbach, and I'm a real estate developer, and I'm here to talk to you about the business side. Uh, there's just too many good people here that understand the problems we're dealing with in the neighborhood. Uh, you don't have to raise your hand. I don't know how many of you have walked through uh, Finch Arboretum. Mm -hmm. that, that is a very important part of Spokane, Washington. And right now, it is a disaster. I'm telling you this because we are having so many problems in our neighborhood, and it is a neighborhood, and Camp Hope and Catholic Charities have not even moved in yet. And I wish this was not true, but what you're doing is you're considering moving a major problem, which we all know it at Camp Hope, and in attempting to solve the problem, you're moving it into a neighborhood which is gonna create more problems. The other thing I want you to understand is the property owners, not right or wrong. <clears throat> All this process started last fall. You know it and I know it. I found out about what was going on here four weeks ago on the news. We didn't know a thing about what was going on here at all except for the news. And ladies and gentlemen, that's not right. That is absolutely not right. The other problem is someone like me, I came in three and a half years ago and I bought a 25,000 square foot office building, totally empty. I, it was 100% empty. Good reasons for it, I won't go into it. I took that building and I totally remodeled it inside and out and today it's basically full. It is full with people from downtown, and it is full with people that have had offices around uh, Catholic Charities. And, and 
please, there is a message there. We know what's going to happen to our neighborhood. I know right now that I have property for 232 units. And I will guarantee you, under these circumstances, I will not build one unit because I know what's going to happen. I have a business friend that has property for 150 units that built the City View, which is a beautiful project. And he, he would like to be here tonight. He's out of town uh, and could not be here tonight. But please understand, he's already told me he's gone. He absolutely will yep. not build a project. And I, I've got it. Your time's up. Personally. So I'm just going to ask you to step back and please understand that you are inviting a major okay. problem into a neighborhood that already Thanks. has problems. Thanks. Thanks for your testimony, again. And what you're going to end up with is up. more problems. You're taking away from other people. Thanks for coming down. Thanks for the map. Sherry Barnett, welcome. Thank you, Council President Biggs and all members of the City Council. As you know, I kind of like to go back in time and I'm thinking of George Washington. He was a very prescient uh, person and he, in his farewell address, he spoke to the people of the problem of going away from uh, caring about one another and becoming centralized by parties. Yeah. And I see that happening in this nation. Also, you know, de Tocqueville, he said, when America, America is great because America is good. When America is no longer good, America will not be great. And that is what is happening to us right now. It's been happening my whole life long. I'm not specifically criticizing people here, but that party thing is going on here in the city council and our city. Spokane is a great city. And no doubt, God has put a lot of favor on this city. But it cannot go along without following his laws. We can't just uh, allow the evil to go unchecked. We have to have rules. We have to have laws for everyone. We cannot allow the schools to teach our children against godly principles in sexuality or in our nation. We cannot allow a party to imprison and make into terrorists someone just because they're not in their party. And so you're elected to represent the people of Spokane. And I believe that the people of Spokane not happy with a lot of things that have happened. But you can change it around. You can do good for this city. And it's hard right now. It's going to be real hard. But with God's help, we can turn this city. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. Uh, next is Kimberly Harby, and then James E., and then Sam Mace. Council. My name is Kimberly Hardy, and I transplanted here to Spokane from Kalispell, Montana, age seven, when my mother joined the Air Force in 1994. My grandparents bought our family homestead in 2000 in the West Hills of Spokane. Class of 2005 from Lewis and Clark High School, go Tigers, returning student to EWU, go Eagles. My dream is to root down on my family's homestead with a nurturing community for my daughter and family. We were not asked if it was okay to put a low barrier shelter on Sunset Hill close to hardworking families. We are taxpayers and we should have a say and a community vote on this issue. There is a wildlife corridor that is threatened by extra foot traffic, potential arson, arson with makeshift homeless structures current, currently being built in Indian Canyon. There are too many times I have had to call crime check or 911 because someone is on my family's property. This will increase if this shelter goes through. What's going to happen when there are too many calls and my home is being broken into? A Spokane cop has told me in a past situation, if I must, shoot to kill. 
I am not a trained marksman. I don't even want to have to think about that possibility. I am grateful to be able to live right down the street from my 89-year-old grandmother and next door to my mother. A homeless man was found in my grandmother's house about a month ago. The cops came and took him away. Luckily, no one was harmed. I am a single mother who just wants to be able to sleep at night knowing there isn't a stranger on my property who could have malicious intent because there, because there are no checks and balances at the moment. This issue needs checked ASAP before an intruder who might just be in search of water and food has been shot out of self-defense by a neighbor protecting their children and family. Rumor has it the homeless also want to be left alone and not herded around like cattle. There need to be solutions and not band-aids. The slogan of the city is near nature, near per perfect. This is not near perfect. The humanitarian aspect of creating more resources to nurture the healing of the homeless needs needs to be addressed and solution found in regards to the community as a whole. Once a healthy and balanced solution is found, then we can use the slogan. Humanity is nature. Hear our voice. Please do not put these camps near our neighborhoods. Put them near helpful resources where they can have easy access to recovery, health, mental health clinics, and creating a program to create water for all. I invite you to look into the Wallace Fountains of Paris, France that were, re were erected in 1871 by humanitarian Sir Richard Wallace. Currently, there are about 1,200 clean drinking water stations around the city of Paris for all, to, for all to consume. This is a solution we could be inspired toward. My grandfather passed in December of 2021. He was a man of hospitality and ran Sunset Hill Restaurant and Lounge back around 2000. His dream was to have a skyrise hotel on top of Sunset Hill where the quality inn sits. Where is the investor to elevate the quality inn and help build the first impressions of Spokane when visitors travel through? These plots are prime location to nourish my community, whether it be condos or hotels catering to business travelers with million dollar views of Spokane. I am one of many who disapprove of the possibility of a low barrier shelter on Sunset Hill. Thank you for your time. Thanks for coming down, Kimberly. And then is James E. here? All right, and after James, it's going to be Sam Mace and then Michelle Welch. Try not to yell into this thing like I did last time. Evening. Um, so lately I've been talking about rental registry and rental control. And now, here's another hot topic. At what point does double deposit become discriminatory? At what point does double deposit end up being used as a tool to deflect those who want to get back on their feet? And this is something that we can actually get behind and put it into. Or if you require a double deposit, give us a five paragraph reason as to why you do. Because if somebody has a credit score below 600, well, okay, um, here's your 650 deposit. Hey, your credit score came in kind of low. Can you pay an additional 650? What does a double deposit have to do with the credit score? I don't see that. A person goes through 10 years of treatment, and they are you know, rehabilitated, everything, they want to get in a new place, but that 10 years ago, hey, can you pay a double deposit? No, I can't afford it. Well, this person, it's like, that was 10 years ago. And they are a extending like, member of society. So this is actually one thing that we can probably put a stop to, because why is it necessary? Are you deflecting? Is this what it's used for? Are you really using it as a deposit? And now they have two deposits. So um, I know it's not, um, it's not um, awesome for landlords to charge last month's rent because the tenant will um, know that the landlord has the money during that time. So why charge that too? I mean, we don't need a double deposit in this state. We don't need a double deposit in Spokane. Guarantee you, start doing that, put a stop to it, and you might see results happen as far as people getting housed. It may happen sooner than you think. And then we can set up programs to help with those landlords that do need more with their deposits. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and look at the statistics of getting those in the house without the double deposit and look at that. Thank you. Thanks, James. Sam Mace and Michelle Welch. Um, 
And I have a map and a handout. Can I? Um, if you can hand it to Terry, that'd be great. President, <laughs> um, uh, President Beggs and the rest of the city council, thanks a lot for uh, a few minutes tonight. Um, Michelle and I are here to share concerns about the proposed dog park in Underhill Park, uh, that the um, Spokane Parks and the Spokane Schools have been working on for a while of coming up with sites for a dog park to replace one being lost on South Hill. It's very clear uh, that this process has been going on for a while without really informing the neighborhoods or park users and neighbors around the parks of what parks have been selected. And I've um, given you kind of a map of it, uh, but Underhill is a really heavily used, well-treasured uh, park in the heart of East Central. Uh, we have baseball parks. We have the only cricket pitch in town. We have, of course, the playground. We have volleyball courts that are used a lot by the Marshallese community and others. And then we have this beautiful natural area also with rocks and beautiful wildflowers in the spring, beautiful light this time of year, birds, everything. And it is really treasured by the kids and adults in the neighborhood that use it right now. Uh, Kids, when the baseball games are going on, kids are playing up there, families are walking. I walk there every day right now with my dog in the morning. And if this proposal goes forward, they're suggesting putting chain link fence around seven acres of our park, taking up pretty much entirely that natural area, taking away the gentle slope that people picnic on in summer and is the little kid sledding hill. Uh, they are projecting 20 to 40 additional cars a day coming down into that parking lot, down a resident, you know, I live on that street, down a dead end street into the parking lot. Uh, we have tight parking now, and we don't mind. We love the use in the park right now. We welcome it. But that's just a little more than we can handle. If they extend, they're going to extend that parking lot out, and we're going to lose the sledding hill. We're asking for the city council, because this isn't just park property, it's mostly city parcels, to take this park off the list. We have enough use. It's going to shut out existing users in a really diverse community of folks that not all of them have the wherewithal, the car, and the income to go to other places to walk on a dirt path. Park staff said to me was, well, those people can just take buses is what we were told in a meeting last week. I think that's pretty unacceptable. And I think that that park, that the users that we have there that come both from outside our neighborhood as well as in the neighborhood should be given consideration. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Sam. Uh, Michelle. And after Michelle is uh, Jay Sharp and then Patrick Dumphy. Well, Sam makes a lot of valid points about how wonderful and beautiful our area is at Underhill Park but I'm coming at it a different perspective. I'm the proud owner of two young Brazilian Mastiffs and I strongly opposed the proposed dog area in Underhill Park. I would love to have a place where my dogs could run and play with abandon, but for me, the area must be relatively flat and uncluttered, and that is not the area that they're proposing at Underhill Park. The area is extremely rocky and uneven with steep hills, dense, dense undergrowth, and very little open space and many large and small trees. There are several rock outcroppings that are 15 to 30 feet tall with sharp rocks at their base. There are large boulders, too numerous to count, that an excited dog while running would love to jump off of, and this could lead to serious injuries to them. Being a dog owner, I love walking my dogs in the hills, but would never dream of letting them run free in this area. With previous dogs, we did do that and they got hurt. One of them had to have shoulder surgery. One of them injured a rear leg. We almost lost one that jumped off the 30-foot cliff into my husband's arms. It broke, you know, we had to have stitches on his chin. They just don't think when they're running and playing. And not to mention the cuts on the pads of their feet and the broken glass and the ton torn toenails. We just learned a very hard lesson early on not to let them run free in that area. In addition, you cannot monitor your dog when they're playing. 
The terrain is too vast. It's too heavily wooded. There's too many rocks and crevices and hills. You, can't, you, can't, you just can't see your dog. And if a dog fight starts, or if there's an injury, you cannot read, you cannot get there in a timely manner. The terrain is just too rough and too varied. And then for us, the freedom is not worth the high likelihood of injury and the corresponding high vet bills. The area is, in, the area is beautiful and to enjoy with and without dogs, but I truly, truly believe it is very dangerous to let dogs run free. I've spoken to several people with, who bring their dogs to the park. They said they'd love to have an area to, for off-leash, but when we look at the hillside, they say, no way, it's way too dangerous. So I'm just asking if, to please consider some other location for this dog park. And if to truly appreciate the challenges and the dangers, I'd suggest you guys come walk it just to see what it's like. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Michelle. Jay? Sharp, and after Jay is Patrick Dunphy, and then Eric John. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> Once again, I would like to state my objection to the sale of the Quality Inn to the Catholic Charities to use as a low barrier homeless shelter in the West Hills community. As stated last week, the project has put at least two, two much needed apartment complexes complex projects adjacent to and approximately 1,700 feet from the proposed shelter on hold due to the negative impact on the neighborhood. The proposal is for a low power barrier housing project, meaning people in this facility can use drugs or can be convicted of drug use and still be allowed to live there. This is provided that they do not use drugs on the property. On a phone call with Catholic Charities, they wanted the neighbors in West Hills community to police drug activity in the neighborhood and report on it. My 76-year-old in-laws just moved in July to the neighborhood with their 14-year-old disabled grandson, just to find out that less than 3,000 feet away from their new home, a low barrier homeless shelter is proposed to be placed. The bus stop that they will be using is less than 1,100 feet away from the proposed homeless shelter. Now Catholic Charities would like to add to the burden by asking them to not only take care of their 14-year-old disabled grandson, but also police the drug activity. If one child in the neighborhood gets involved with drugs or loses their life due to the homeless shelter, that is simply one too many. My neighbors and I already need to police our area from transients abandoning motorhomes and cars in our area and literally trying to camp in my yard. And after they leave, they also leave their garbage where my five-year-old daughter finds it. The West Hills has no social services. It is a residential community with no industries to support jobs for these potential residents. It is two miles away from the closest grocery store and it has no health care facilities for them. My neighbors are not police officers, but we are being asked to be and we do not want to be placed into a position where we have to defend our families due to Catholic Charities placement of this low barrier shelter. I ask the city council to not approve a change of use for 4301 West Sunset Boulevard for use as a homeless shelter. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Um, Patrick, Dumphy, and after Patrick is Eric, and then Christine Quinn. Greetings. Uh, I have to reiterate what's already been said about the proposed shelter in the West Hills neighborhood. Um, I've lived here all my life. I've looked in that neighborhood for housing for myself and my family well over 30 years. That neighborhood is not generally recognized as a prominent neighborhood because it's tucked back in the hill. We don't normally drive up and down Sunset and see the houses and all the, all the families that live back in that neighborhood. Uh, it's considered quite a sanctuary. There are multiple generations living in that neighborhood, same families. Uh, what's being proposed by Catholic Charities, I mean, proves they're, they're after cash flow over compassion. It has nothing to do with anything other than padding their bottom line. They're setting up LLCs in order to fund these things, get them set up, and then they abandon it, walk away. As, as is seen downtown, they expect the neighbors, the businesses around to observe, make calls to the police, monitor it for them. 
there's absolutely no accountability for what they're proposing and how they're going to maintain that. It's, it's completely irresponsible to allow that process to go through. Right now in the neighborhood, as was previously mentioned, there's a half a dozen houses for sale. And normally, in a year, year and a half, you might have that many. But right now, people are making a mass exodus out of that neighborhood for what's on the table and what you're planning on putting there. Okay. Thanks for coming down. Uh, Eric, John, you can introduce yourself. I might not be pronouncing your name right. And uh, Christine Quinn and then Rick Bocook. Yep, you're pronouncing it right. Before I start, um, can I just ask that you guys don't stare at your phones the whole time? It'd be super cool. So set them here to speak about, guess what, West Hills. Several days ago, I sent an email expressing our neighborhood's frustrations regarding the completely opaque nature of these plans that will drastically affect the lives of all West Hills residents. I don't know that I need to rehash how. I want to read to the rest of the council and the response from Lori Kinnear to make sure that these are truly the views of the council as a whole and in your view are zero factual inaccuracies or otherwise dissenting opinions. Because we have received very mixed messages very consistently. The email begins. Hi Eric, based on the presentations made to me, the current option, the shelter, seems like an improvement over the hotels currently operating there. By what criteria did you come to this decision? What were these presentations? So just to be clear, you, got, you can read the email, but if your questions, direct them to me, not individuals up here. Okay. Yeah. What, were the, what was the criteria for the, the formation of this opinion? Do we get to see the content of these presentations? How did you become so convinced? We'd love to see that. We'd love to see a detailed pros and cons list of the hotel versus the shelter. Maybe there's something we don't know. We'd also love to see a list of all the other locations considered and a detailed description of all the research on which I'm sure there's lots because you would not have made this decision in a cavalier manner, I'm sure. All the research that chose, that pointed towards West Hills being the best option, other than of course, it not being where you guys live. The email continues. The guests would be curated ahead of time for readiness and they would be supervised. How do we define curated? Are we talking formal background checks? Are we talking the arbitrary opinion of those who happen to be working there on a given day? The friends of these individuals, what is curated? Now, they would be supervised. Oh, well, that's very nice. Supervised on the premises. What about off the premises? In fact, the more they're subject to strict rules on the premises means the more likely they are to go off the premises in which there are zero rules. So that really means nothing. And is there any sort of plan for oversight or punishment for Catholic charities for when crimes are committed? Are they held accountable in any way, shape, or form? Eric, Don't know. You're, you're out of time for tonight. Okay. So, so thanks for coming down. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. All right. Is Christine Quinn here? While we're waiting. Let's have uh, Rick Bocook while we're waiting for Christine. And after Rick and Christine, are, it looks like Melanie Perry and then Chris Schuler. Greetings. I want to go on record about um, the uh, First Amendment interference at STA Plaza. They were, they were in a lawsuit on First Amendment. And um, they got this creepy preacher guy across the street amplified telling everybody they're going to go to Lockie's daughter's home. I don't know if you know who that is. Her name is Hell, Norwegian source. But anyway, um, to me, he's a creep, and I have a right to call him a creep. 
But the securitist guy tells me I can't do that. Well, let me give you an example about my freedom of speech at the STA Plaza. It's called a public forum. So if I see Brian half blocked down, I can say, hey, Brian, same level that I'm telling this guy that he's a creep. That's my freedom of speech. But yet, the securitist guy is telling me I can't do that. So I think they need to be put on notice that stop interfering with our freedom of speech on a public forum. Now, here's another example about freedom of speech. And I've seen this, where people have gotten this close to people's faces, and they're saying some really heavy-duty stuff. And unless they're threatening a person, they usually can say that stuff. <clears throat> I know if it gets too heavy that they let the police involved, and the police will put a little barrier up and divide you up. Counter-protesting, protesting. So that stuff happens. <clears throat> but I'm, I'm still having very serious... Now, these things that have been happening here, what I've been hearing... I've been hearing people that are super highly privileged. They, have no, they don't seem to have any concept about what happens when somebody's in poverty. You know, everything's okay for them, but not the people in poverty. The people in poverty suck to them, and they don't belong anywhere except where the government's supposed to put them. I know why that hotel's being picked. is because it happens to be a building. It's like the building out there in Trent. It's a building. It's a big building. And they're talking about a crime rate up there. There's three or four motels up there that have a high crime. They got prostitution. They got drug dealing. It's up there. It has nothing to do with that motel. They're talking paranoia. You got to get to listen to paranoia. That's what you're listening to. You're listening. There's going to be a crime wave if they move all these people from Camp Hope. You're right. Like, they're stereotyping everybody down there. That's paranoia. And I'm going to say it loudly. Paranoia. You guys are being paranoid back there <clears throat> by, by saying you're stereotyping all these people. They're going to increase your crime. How do you know? If you wrote a letter to the, if you put a petition to the judge for an injunction against Catholic charities, and if you said the stuff you're saying here, guess what the judge is going to do? He's going to laugh at you and say, where's your proof? So if you really want to do something, do the petition to the judge. Put an injunction against Catholic charities and see what happens. That, that's your legal process. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Rick. We're not doing applause. Um, did Christine Quinn come or not? All right. All right. Melanie Perry. And after Melanie is Chris Schuler and then Ed Stevenson. Welcome, Melanie. Hello. I'm back. <laughs> um, my name is Melanie Perry. I'm a community member. I help out a lot in the community with uh, Cool Spokane. We're looking for more volunteers next week. If anyone's available, please get in touch. Cool Spokane is our hashtag. Um, anyway, <laughs> I, in doing a lot of this work out in the community, it's pretty clear that there's just a lack of public services, lack of public bathrooms, a lack of usable drinking fountains, trash cans that are available to the public are not cleared out as much. The one right out here in City Hall is so full that you can't even open it anymore. It's a bit of a problem. Um, yeah, so when a lot of people are up here complaining about littering and just like there being junk and things smelling bad, people don't want to ruin their surroundings. Most people would prefer to keep places clean, but if they don't have access to the trash cans or bathroom, it's just gonna have to happen where it happens. So if we as a community can agree that these sort of things should be free and available to everyone, you'll see a lot less litter and a lot less stuff on the <laughs> sidewalks and areas you don't want to see. Um, also, I just kind of want to challenge people to try to think differently instead of trying to separate yourselves from different kinds of people. You should be thinking about everyone as your neighbor, whether or not they actually have a house. They're part of your community. They're part of your neighbor. Because it's a wonderful day in this neighborhood, a wonderful day for a neighbor. Won't you be mine? So that's just where I'm at with this. Thank you.
Thanks, Melanie. Chris Truler, Ed Stevens, D. Stevenson, and then Nolan Sterner, I believe. Hello, I'm Chris Schuler, Christine. Um, yeah, I wanted to, exp you know, we got some new members here, so I wanted to come back and explain a little bit more about my history of why I'm so upset about this. You know, maybe, so some of you don't know. Um, I was abducted at birth within two, within two minutes of being born. I was abducted, so I never had a mom. Um, the men who kept me were very high-level police officers, sheriff, um, the boss of the military, uh, the highest level of CIA, FBI, special op forces. These were very highly intelligent men. And they had kidnapped me, abducted me, and kept me as their slave. I did not get a paycheck. I was, for 47 years, I was a slave without a paycheck. I was human trafficked to the military soldiers, very brutally abused and did not get paid. I did not know my, my, my mother, my, my siblings. Okay, so 47 years of slavery, they died, I was released. I was super glad to have my freedom. I didn't wanna talk about it. I wanted to move forward in life. And on crumbs, I was able to create myself a business working out of a house in the Camp Hope area where there's no more houses. Made myself a job making stickers. I was full on it, right? And within like about a year into that, the, the government, public workers came along and just tore down the entire neighborhood. It's gone very quickly. Where am I gonna live? Uh, unfortunately, there's nowhere to live. Unfortunately, we have no more funding. We ran out of funding for the relocation assistance that was required by law, left me homeless. I didn't go to any shelter. Um, and I'm not stupid. I was very highly trained, even though I don't have a, a high school diploma. The, the, the men who kept me would, would kill you for being stupid. Okay, and so then I get up within the Catholic Charities. I'm renting an apartment. It's not a shelter, it's an apartment. I purchased preschoolpolitics.com and started studying politics in the year 2011 before I ever met Catholic Charities. And when I move into their apartment, suddenly they say, I can't do that. They're managing my life and it's not their right to decide that I, that, that I have to be liberal because they are. Um, my website had nothing to do with Catholic Charities whatsoever, but yet they've been threatening me. I've been coming here and complaining about it. The trouble is I'm a poor people. I can't afford a lawyer, so you all just ignore me. And it's gotten so bad out of shape that guess what? Now lawyers are going to step up and do it for free. Um, um, very expensive lawyers. You should know that. That's what happens when you get out of hand. You bully and you bully and you bully the poor person who can't afford a lawyer. Then, you, then a free lawyer steps up. So I want to cease and desist of all taxpayer-funded workers doing that to me. Yeah, you're past your time. Thanks for coming down. Ed Stevenson, then Nolan, and then Justin O'Connell. Good evening, Council President and uh, members of the City Council. Um, as you all know, we have a huge homeless problem and addiction problem, not only in Spokane, but in every city across the nation. And if we all work together, we can actually come up with a solution. But what I see is five-year plans that continue to fail over and over. And the county put out a five-year plan in 2017. Now there's a new plan, five-year plan in 2020. These plans are you know, 50 pages long, but they have no metri metrics in them to comply. And you know, I've worked with a lot of addicts, a lot of homeless people from prison, and you know, homelessness le leads to addiction. Addiction leads to homelessness. Both lead to mental illness. And that's what we're seeing on the street. We come up with needle exchange programs, and if you understand addiction, they're not looking for a clean needle, they're looking for a sharp needle treatment has become a revolving door. And I wanna paint a really clear picture of all of the things that are leading up to what we're seeing in, on our streets today. It's not just what the point in time survey points out. You know, the point in time survey points out family con conflict, lack of income, job loss, affordable housing, drug use and eviction. 94% of them say lack of income. 
But you gotta look into it a little deeper and find out why are all these occurring? Is it because of real family conflict? What created that family conflict? Was it mental illness, illness, addiction, or lack of income? We don't know, but those are the things that we need to dig into. And we really need to look at this deeper, because when you find someone in an alleyway or under a bridge or on a park bench in this point of time, you think they're gonna tell a perfect stranger the truth? No, they're gonna say what they think you wanna hear. Uh, if you become homeless, can you imagine the despair, the lack of dignity that they suffer? Something that we can't even comprehend. They dig a hole so deep that they can't get out of it and they're sitting next to someone who's using drugs and they say, geez, how am I gonna get myself out of this? They have no way out of it. You know, we put people, we treat people with Suboxone, then we send them on their way. Now they're, they're struggling. We have a, if you look at the point in time from 2018 to 2012, we have a 41% increase in four years in homelessness. We need more solutions than what we have. Our, our housing is the worst in the nation. It's number three in the nation, worst in the state. What we need is affordable housing, mental health treatment, addiction, socialization, and job training. If you look at our statistics from the police department, we have a 300% increase in shootings. Ed, within your time, thanks for coming down. Uh, Nolan, thank you. You can introduce yourself so I can get your last name. I can't quite read it. And then Justin O'Connell and then Alexis Tenasket. Okay, my name is Nolan Steiner and I live in the West Hills for about 20 years. And um, obviously I'm here about the homeless shelter. And uh, just for the people at home, I just wanna remind them that we're looking at a mural right now with some birds in the background and they're magpies. And I just wanted to reflect upon those birds. So, um, and then I'll get into a little bit more. So there is a, a superstitious belief associated with magpies, whereby the sight of a single magpie is said to bring sorrow or bad luck. The sight of two magpies is said to bring joy or good luck. So the fact that you're more than one to me, I hope is good luck. But I do want to express myself to you, really. Um, the West Hill shelters, you know, Betsy had mentioned, or Councilwoman Betsy had mentioned, on the Trent shelter, we have an out clause. Well, I don't believe the West Hills neighborhood feels like we have an out clause for what's being proposed because we've never been heard. We've never been formally on the agenda. It's all open forum. And I actually have to shout out to Council, Councilman Cathcart for um, proposing a, a, a larger discussion, and thank you, Councilman, about this is a societal burden, homelessness. The West Hills, at least in my opinion, should not be shouldering a concentrated risk of the homelessness, which is a real issue because we actually have shelters in our neighborhood. And if you look at the shelters that are in our neighborhood compared to our taxpaying residents, it's a high concentration. It's probably, my guess, and I think the city should know this, a much higher concentration than say, the South Hill or wherever you might live, you know. So I think you just need to look at the distribution of, of help in, in our communities. The West Hills is not rich. It's not the South Hill. We don't have the power center, um, but I believe we can help. And I think that, you know, what's interesting, if I were to try to thread the needle, Lori, you had mentioned, should we look at kind of a community-wide solution? Address, I appreciate your, your friendliness, but can you keep addressing to me if you can? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. I've heard some comments here that maybe there's a larger discussion to be had, which is what's the community solution, not just what's a West Hills um, put option on the community of West Hills for a larger societal problem. So I've heard from Lori that you had mentioned that maybe there's a larger discussion, and I think Zach, I'm not sure if you had mentioned this, of a tax component of where you actually have a shared burden of society. I believe right now West Hills, the discussion is it's a high concentration that's coming to West Hills. And I'm not happy about that. I live in West Hills, but I actually believe I can support something that's a shared burden. Okay. 
Thanks Thank for coming you. down, though. Uh, Justin O'Connell, and then Alexis Tanaskit, and then Derek Zant. Good evening, council members, council president, Justin O'Connell, central planning. You're all getting a lot of grief about the unhoused. And even from the unhoused, you're seeking solutions. The LA Times has them. Quote, should we set up New Deal style work camps for the needy? Yes, brilliant. Why didn't I think of this? Labor camps for the homeless, duh. To quote one businessman, we can collect a lot of the individuals from various villages that are popping up so we can collect the people like Facebook. The government has already built work camps before to house the Okies, you know, the Oklahomans, who had been booted out of the Hoovervilles, the Great Depression. Back then, citizens and politicians protested the Okies' presence in the streets. Sound familiar? We know the respectable class's view of the Okies from our experience today. The labor camps function as a safe space for the homeless. The Okies had running water, clean rooms, the works. We can offer them free buses to the camps. We don't have the best track record with camps in this region, the internment camps, but these new camps can give the unhoused dignity. That's why we would call it Camp Dignity. Doesn't that sound nice? Dallas wants to house the unhoused on a military base outside of a town called Dignity Field. Mayor Julie Winter read, Mayor Julie Winter of Redding, California gets it. She wants to declare an emergency to build a mega shelter for the unhoused people. Unfortunately, it's a concentration camp, not a labor camp. Mayor Winter told NPR, quote, it's not a facility you could just leave because you wanted to. Exactly, Mayor Winter gets it. She's ahead of the, her time. I love you, Mayor Winter. Okay, so there's precedent for, th for all this. In the 1880s, as LA skid row filled with transients, LA respondents with forced LA responded with forced labor camps. If LA of 1880 can do it, so can we. We pay the prisoners like 40 cents an hour in the forced labor camps uh, for the unhoused. Maybe let's start negotiations at like $1. I'm sure we can get uh, a minimum wage exception. You know, we could do a minimum wage exception for the entire private sector too. eliminate the minimum wage so the private sector can hire more people. Walter Block has come up with this idea, but I like the LA Times' idea more. If we can't get the unhoused into jails we call jails, let's just put them into camp dignity. Thank you, and have a nice Labor Day from Central Planning. Thanks for coming down, Justin. Alexis Tanaskit. And Derek Zant after that, and then Sarah Hunter. Why Hessel Halt is squeezed Gawashal what? My name is, um, I said greetings and good day, and my Salish name is Skawashawat, and my English um, government name is Alexis Tanaskit. Um, so I know that the point in time count was mentioned earlier, but I wanted to get into some of the specific details of that because there's a lot of feelings floating around in the room, but there's not a whole lot of facts um, from what I'm hearing, um, from pe what people are saying. So the point in time count happened again this year in 2022. More than 1,700, um, actually exactly 1,757 unhoused individuals were counted and asked a few questions. 74% reported having lived in Spokane County before becoming homeless. So all of the people who are saying that people are being shipped here from somewhere else, that's just false and inaccurate. Um, it's not factual. Uh, the majority of those people had a local address for 10 or more years in this county before they became homeless. People were asked why they became homeless. The number one reason was lack of affordable housing. One in three said that they struggle with mental illness. If there's one in three people admitting to themselves and able to articulate that they're struggling with mental illness, imagine how many people are not able to do that and who are then not able to actually take care of themselves and uh, take care of all the responsibilities needed to maintain their bodies and their space and housing and all of that. Um, uh, the point in time count asked, what services are you most in need of? And the number one response was housing. There were 198 more people counted this year than in 2020. 
So this is a growing problem. Um, and I'm concerned that if we don't do things to make changes that it will just keep growing. And the most common reason for not using existing shelters was fear of violence, safety, privacy, and anxiety, which ironically is reflected in a lot of the people who came to speak against people having access to this shelter. And I also wanted to point out um, the hypocrisy as a biracial indigenous person, it is very hard to sit here and listen to people complaining about, I don't want this here on my, near my property. I don't want this here near my park. Do you think indigenous people consented to any of the city being here? The answer is no. Indigenous people did not consent to the city being here. City Hall is built on the tribal gathering place where many tribes have come together for, since time immemorial. So I just wanted to point out the hypocrisy in that because it's, um, like someone mentioned earlier, a lot of privilege. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Alexis. Uh, Derek Zant, and then Sarah Hunter. I have and then... a little bit more time, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. One more thing. So I just wanted to say that the least we can do if we're going to have a city without indigenous consent on this indigenous land, the least we can do is get organized and get serious about cleaning up our messes and taking care of human beings' basic needs. Thanks. It's the least. Thank you. All right. Derek Zant and then Sarah Hunter, and then Justin, I think, Hammer or Havmer? Thank you, council members and council president. Um, I was originally going to come here today and read what my wife had intended to speak in, in her stake. She couldn't make it, but she's here. If you'd like, I'd like to have her come up and read what, in her own words. Well, she's, okay. Is that okay? That's fine. All right. Thank you for allowing me to take my husband's place. Take a moment to imagine a safe community. Close your eyes and picture it. What does it look like? The streets, the homes, the neighborhoods. How does it feel? No matter what comes to mind, everyone deserves to have a say in their community, including the people of East Central. What is the thoughts and words of one council member Wilkerson? But apparently, when East Enders are being excluded, it's cause for protest. But West Enders, our representatives, don't care. It doesn't matter how many residents say, we do not want this in our neighborhood. We do not consent. Our opinions are discarded like yesterday's garbage. You treat East Enders like the valuable human beings they are. But to you, I'm nothing but garbage. In my office building downtown, we have found hidden weapons from the homeless. Knives, pipes, cudgels. You were delivered a letter from a construction company saying that females are particular targets. Statistics bear out that crime is risen 58% among the homeless encampments. You know this and you ignore it. My house was prowled. I called the cops as it was happening. Nothing was done. After 45 minutes, though, they did finally consent to show up. I am a survivor of horrific rape. And do you have any freaking idea what it is like to know that more assaults are coming? You are powerless to stop it. Your elected officials are cheering it on. You have no idea what it's like to know that your own home is no longer going to be a safe haven and your elected officials don't care that their constituents will be assaulted and raped. And I sincerely hope that your God is a forgiving one because you will not find any from me. Thanks for coming down, Sarah Hunter. And then again, I'm not reading the last name exactly, but... No, the year later, there's another Justin. Is there another Justin here? Maybe not. 
but, but there's two different people signed up, so but we'll get to you too. Anyway, after Sarah is uh, then Julie Boardman and then Reed Oaks. Hi, I'm Sarah Hunter. Um, yeah. I'm from West Hills, and um, I'm trying to look at your guys' plan from a nursing perspective. And some people have told me that the people from Camp Hope do want to recover and that they could go into the 120-bed uh, quality and, and such to do so. But it draws in question when I, I believe that we're going to spend $14 million just to kind of get it up and running, and there's 30 staff, non-licensed staff there. Well, non-licensed staff can't med medicate mental illness, nor can they medicate somebody going through substance withdrawal. I want to know if, in your guys' plan, have we talked to Deaconess and Sacred Heart on how we're going to transfer them over to our facility where we can give the proper medication so somebody doesn't die from substance abuse withdrawal? Because that is generally what happens, especially with alcohol withdrawal, that we see people go into different cardiac arrhythmias, Ativan, other drugs that are also addictive are prescribed in order to treat the symptoms of withdrawal. So when you were to further yourselves in this plan, I'd like to see if you guys could come up with some efforts to correlate a real care plan with real health professionals. Thank you. Thanks for coming down. Uh, Julie Boardman, then Reed Oaks, and then Elizabeth Oaks. <laughs> Welcome, Julie. Hi, my name's Julie Boardman, and uh, I grew up here. My parents um, built a house on Rimrock Drive, and my sister lives there now. I now live three houses down around the block on Basalt, and we grew up there thinking that it was a safe place to live. I used to play at Indian Canyon, you know, as a kid without supervision. And now I don't even feel safe taking a walk around my neighborhood. Um, Catholic Charities does have those other transitional homes, Motel 6, the Econo Lodge, the Westwind Motel down below. And ever since then, I used to go shopping at Rose Hours on 3rd since I was five years old. And now I don't even want to shop there because there are fights that break out in the parking lot. <laughs> They have security now. I've had to ask security to escort me to my car after dark. There are needles found up and down Bonnie Drive, and um, I don't have to explain all the rest of it. Everybody has expressed the things, the reasons why that homeless shelter shouldn't go in. But one thing I want to ask you all is how would you feel if the city council and the Catholic Charities wanted to do that in your backyard, a half a mile from your home, how would you feel? I'm sure some of you have kids. I, I am my mother's caretaker. She's 81, and I have my great nephew that lives in the house I grew up. He has to walk to the bus to catch the bus, and we can't even do that now because it's not safe anymore. I've had a guy across from my house uh, field defecate at a, right on Bonnie Drive. There are campers who were across from me who could look right into my house. They left their trash, their recliner, their it, just garbage. It's just there are other avenues for this shelter. There are other things, and I don't think this is something that needs to be pushed through right away. I think other it needs to be looked into further. And I just ask you seriously to think about how you would feel if this happened to any one of you. Thank you. Thanks, Julie, for coming down. Uh, Reed Oaks and then Elizabeth Oaks and then Sean Strasberg. Uh, council President Bre uh, Beggs and fellow council members, Thank you for having me and offering this forum to express my concerns about the Catholic Charities Catalyst Project. I was born in Spokane, and after a childhood spent all over western half of the United States, I, spent, I settled back in Spokane after my enlistment in the Air Force nearly 30 years ago. I raised two children, owned multiple properties, worked locally, and voted at every opportunity. I've supported expensive bonds, levies, and paid an awful lot of taxes in the years to keep our beautiful Lilac City on the forefront of growth. 
In my work life, I'm a global expert and executive focused on health information sharing and the fostering of transparency in, healthcare in the healthcare industry around the world. Many of these same qualities we need here desperately. These days at home, I'm a neighbor in the West Plains and Palisades, aspiring community farmer, husband, and dog dad. I find myself at a loss to understand or explain how my city council and state leadership has decided to not only defer and bulldoze beneficial positive development of our area, but rather to insult the West Hills and Palisades communities by bypassing public engagement and collaboration and forcing something as impactful as the Catalyst program down our throats with little public discourse. Within our area today, we regularly find used syringes, other drug paraphernalia, trash, crash pads, and many other causes for concern, many of which have been mentioned on, on numerous occasions. We have to watch closely what our puppy finds of interest in the bushes. We have neighbors already impacted with losses due to significant theft and little to no assistance from law enforcement on a timetable that would have caught and prosecuted those responsible. Our law enforcement organizations are significantly under-resourced and undermanned to respond to today's challenges with no expansion plan to take on this new development. Subsequently, we, my neighbors and I, are being asked to take on this new project and indeed to keep watch and report and hope to get a response from law enforcement. This is not our role in the community. Homelessness and addiction are nationwide public health crises. It's been mentioned numerous times tonight. My neighbors and I understand the need to find a solution and it is impossible to find a productive outcome when everything is pushed through with undue haste, shrouded in secrecy, conflicts of interest, and no collaboration with local residents. There is no apparent sustainability plan. Grants are not a business plan. Councilwoman Wilkerson has already noted the $9 million hole that's coming from the Trent shelter. We have had public forums promised, delayed, then canceled seemingly to placate and somehow hope that we will forget. No information is shared, no comparative analysis, no demonstration or commitment of low impact, no expectation of alignment with Catholic charities. What happens when we need to find a resolution when a Catalyst resident is found in crisis? We don't even have consistent internet or cell phone coverage within the neighborhoods, let alone any stores, addiction services, restaurants, sources of local income or otherwise engaging with the, with the those. We've come to the end of your time for tonight. Great, thank you. All right, thanks for coming down. Elizabeth Oakth. After Elizabeth, Alyssa Eklund and Sean Strasberg. Hi everybody, thanks for having us tonight and thanks for having me. I am here this evening to speak about the quality and acquisition as well. Um, there's been a learning curve for the residents of the surrounding neighborhood in the last month, West Hills and the Palisades. Uh, since the plan to place a large low barrier shelter came to light in a newspaper article. We're playing catch up and while we haven't been invited to the conversation by the powers that be, city leaders, the right of way committee and Catholic charities, we have opinions and preferences. Many of us are rapidly educating ourselves on different types of shelter, shelters, what low barrier means versus high barrier, what is a pallet village, also what is a blight on a neighborhood. I've learned about sustainable models like Liz from West Central was talking about, um, models that help the homeless like Habitat for Humanity's Zombie Home Project that rehabs derelict houses into low income homes, a great idea based on the scale of Spokane. I read Ben Stuckert is part of a nonprofit seeking funding to do this as well. But this, I dream of revitalization for this stretcher, stretch of Sunset Highway that is up for discussion, where the Old Quality Inn is the crown jewel at the top of the hill. But as this project with deep pockets has been thrust upon the neighborhood, myself and many others, we have had to follow the news stories and rumors to get a sense of what's in the works. We wonder what is being planned. I want best practices from my local government. I want transparency. I'm sad to say that as a taxpaying resident of Spokane, I have been excluded from the dialogue about major changes to my neighborhood. Some people are in on this conversation, some will profit from it, from it, and some of us get to come to city council meetings to get their three minutes on record without dialogue. But it's a dialogue worth getting in on, and this is just the start. Massive amounts of right-of-way funds are coming to Spokane. Far beyond the seven million gifted by the right-of-way committee to the Catholic Charities for this real estate purchase, or the 24 million noted in the grant application. 
A recent Inlander article highlights $144 million of grant money. To quote the article, the agency will pay nonprofits that can help house and serve people camping in five counties, including Spokane. The powers that be in the committee are facilitating real estate purchases for a charitable arm of the Catholic Church, one of the wealthiest entities in the world. We don't see local churches, and there are more than 100 of them here in Spokane. We don't see them opening their doors at night to house the homeless. Yet charities want us to open our neighborhood to take the brunt of this desperate problem without so much as a discussion. Thank you for hearing me this evening, and I hope this is a topic of conversation among you all. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, Alyssa Eklund. And after Alyssa is Sean Strasberg and then Justin Tower. Council members, Hi. my name is Alyssa. Um, I am an addict in recovery. I spent 18 years in active addiction. Uh, the last eight years of those, I was an IV drug user. Today, I'm a current resident of Ascenda, which is a clean and sober living house at the bottom of Sunset Hill. Today, uh, I'm learning how to be an active, productive member of society. Uh, I have a full-time job working with people who have substance abuse disorder and mental health, Ill mental health illness. Um, when I heard about this, this uh, low barrier shelter being built near Ascenda, um, I think about all the people whose recovery would be at risk. Um, even with just the Cannon Street shelter down the road, uh, we do have instances where stuff is stolen, cars are prowled, um, cars park across the way, and uh, people recline their chairs. And I wonder, and I'm afraid, if I walk up to that vehicle, if they're going to be dead of overdose. Uh, fear is uh, an understatement, um, not for just myself, but other people who are in recovery. Um, I fight hard for what I have today. Um, Ascenda has um, been my home for one year. Um, in this time, I have built my credit from a 500 to a 680. Uh, I'm very proud of that. Um, recovery doesn't happen overnight. It's a long process. Treatment centers, I believe in. Detox facilities, I believe in. Shelters, I believe in. But it's what happens outside the shelters that we need to be afraid of. Uh, there's no cap on what can happen. For 18 years, I chose on and off to live in, in homeless camps and in tents by the lake. I chose to shoot up in bathrooms, park bathrooms, porta potties. I stole from my family. I cased houses. I stole gas, cut fuel lines. I'm not proud of those things, but those are the things that I have to fear today in recovery. Please reconsider. Uh, last night, I went to bed with the thoughts of what, what's going to happen, not only to the people who live there, but the people who are in recovery. So, my property is not on the line, but my life is. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming down, Lisa. Sean Strasburg. After Sean is Justin, and then Susan Menching. Thanks for everybody that's uh, sat through this. There's a lot of good stuff that's been said. Um, I don't know. I came here to Spokane uh, for work. Um, I was struggling with in 2020 with the uh, epidemic, and uh, you know, I found work here, and I also found uh, uh, I hurt myself, and I went down the wrong road, become an IV drug user. Um, you know, I already had problems in the past with. Uh, Opiates, you know, the story you probably always hear, you know, you get prescribed meds, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing is, is like, I engaged in services. I reached out. There's 12-step programs. Um, I've engaged with churches that have helped me uh, immensely. People in Spokane um, <laughs> saved my life. And, uh, you know, I love this city, and, and I, I like to give back as much as I can. I've, I've worked um, in shelters here. Um, and I'm just not going to list who I worked with because I haven't talked to them. And I don't want to say that I represent them with my opinion. Um, but I have experience. And when shelters are run right, they can be really good. But the thing is, is they attract so much problems. Um, and, and that's part of, Spokane kind of has a, a, 
a recovery uh, um, industry. But the thing is, like every treatment center we open up, 3% of people that get out stay clean. So then we got more users, more drug dealers. And, and the thing is, is we got to get engaged as community. When you get back into a society, like my recovery looks like I go to a lot of 12 step meetings. I go to church, I go to Bible study. I have friends in recovery. Um, and I do silly stuff like this because I, I care. But like, that's my recovery is like everything in my life. And I engage with people that are winning. You know, I choose not to be homeless today. Like I've been homeless, but when I get homeless, I do the things so that I don't have to stay homeless. Like, which means I can't get high. You know, I just had to pass a UA this morning at my clean and sober living so I could stay there. And it's a choice I make. Now I understand when I'm deep in addiction, like I had to call somebody on the uh, hot, on a hotline. I'm not going to say where because that's once again I'm not representing them. But uh, somebody picked up and they told me they said you want, you want to do what you got to do to stay clean. I said yeah. I went to Sacred Heart. Um, I had to wait 18 hours to get into detox, but I threw my heroin away, so I was able to make it because I went to 12 step meetings until that opened up. I stayed in there. I got into uh, uh, clean and sober living. You know. And, and and it works. And the thing is, is people that choose to stay homeless choose to stay homeless to a degree. And it's sad. Um, there's a good percentage Sean. that really need the help. Sean, th thanks for sharing your story yep. coming down here. Uh, Justin, after Justin, Susan Menching, and then Antoine. Hello again. My pronouns are Ron Swanson. If you don't know Parks and Rec, that's a joke. But um, I'm about fiscal responsibility. Where does the money go? And, and why do we spend it the way we do? Um, I'm wondering where the $50,000 went for the, from the Canadian company that we gave our uh, parking meters over to. I'd like to know the answer to that question someday. Um, your, your predecessor didn't want to answer that. He wasn't discussing that that day. Um, maybe some way we can figure out that. Um, I also want to know why we don't get a portion of the pot tax dollars back for Minsley. Be nice. Maybe we could take some of that pot tax dollars and put it towards potholes. What, what a concept. Um, skipping around a little bit on my notes. Um, you're you're gonna uh, you're gonna take out eight hundred and ninety eight dollars from someone who didn't show up, who arrogantly said, "I can't be bothered to show up to a forty six thousand seven hundred dollar part time job." Who who here can afford to not show up to a forty six thousand seven hundred dollar part time job? I, I I don't I don't know that I would be there arrogant to do that. Just just saying. You know, I'm pretty arrogant. Um, as far as the homeless situation, you throw so much money at it, but you never fix it. It's almost like it's an industrial complex that you just, you just, just need a little bit more, just, just a little more. Well, you know what? That sounds like a drug addict. You guys, are, you guys are drug addicts. You guys are actually you're more like drug dealers because you're like, oh, just, just, give me a little, just give me a little more. Give me a little more. Give me a little more. Oh, we'll give you nothing. Oh, nothing. You know, it, it's just deplorable that you allowed Camp Dope. That's not Camp Hope. It's Camp Dope. Let's, let's be honest. To happen in the first place. You allowed that to happen. And you won't invite 100 people to your neighborhood, your neighborhood, your neighborhood, your neighborhood. You won't do it. Your neighborhood. Invite, invite 100 people to each of your neighborhoods and see how that works out for you. See if crime is actually down like you claim it is. I don't know how you can claim that crime is down. When, there, when there's stabbings and shootings, there was a, a, a shooting less than a block from where I live, and I moved out of downtown. I mean, come on. You know, I mean, it's just it, it's deplorable. So no, Nothing you've ever done has fixed anything, and 
Money doesn't solve these things. Jail rehab or a ticket out of town does. Compassion looks like tough love. It doesn't look like throwing money at stuff into, into places that people don't want it. How about you have it in your neighborhood? Oh, and by the way, Fish Lake Trail, I, I, can't, I can't park there. Not thanks, only are there dead people, down. but there's, there's, there's break-ins, too. Thanks for coming down, Justin. Susan. Thanks for being useless. Uh, Menching, and then Antoine. And then it's going to be Susan. Are you Antoine? Yes. He, it's Susan first and then Antoine. I, I'm doing a couple at a time. Yeah. We'll get you right after Susan. Thanks. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Council. I appreciate taking a few minutes of your time again. As Community Assembly member for the West Hills, I have been trying to bridge um, some communication and trying to hear what my neighbors are saying. I moved to West Hills four years ago, so I'm not a long-time Spokaneite like most people here. But when I moved into the West Hills, I fell in love. I fell in love with a 1909 Victorian craftsman. And then I fell in love with my neighborhood. I enjoy the area, but more so, I enjoy my neighbors. And if one thing that has happened with this, what I call a debacle, and it really is, is that you have joined a family. We are a West Hills family, and we are going to stand together and make sure we've been called NIMBY, we've been called privileged, we've been called um, uncaring, and that is far from what is happening, what I'm seeing with my neighbors. Their concern are for the homeless, and they are also concerned for their families and their houses and everything else that goes with that. One thing that nobody knows with my West Hills family is I have a daughter who is houseless. She is not homeless. She is choosing what she is at in Olympia, Washington. I brought her home, I cleaned her up, and I got her where she was stable. And then I had requirements. I had accountability like my parents had taught me accountability. We must earn our way, whatever that way may be. And I made her say, you need to get a job. I'll house you, I'll feed you, I'll care with you. This is a 32-year-old girl, woman, young woman. And it took that much that you need to have some sort of job. I didn't care where it was, what you were doing, but just have a job, get out there. She chose to go back to an abusive relationship instead of go. It broke her father and my heart to know that she would choose that over just getting out there and earning a living. I pray every day that she's okay, and we're hoping that she will finally come home and decide to be part of society. We all have responsibilities in society, and I want to make sure that you understand that these people are fighting for their families so that they can see what is going on and improve it. We love the Ascenda people. I am so proud of them. And to hear those stories, I don't want anything to happen to that group. And we've heard terrible rumors about additional pallet shelters. It's going to hurt them, and we can't do that. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Chair and Susan. Antoine, thanks for coming. After Antoine is Kathleen Sharp. Hi, my name is uh, Anton. Okay, uh, I sit in last week and I've listened to both sides, you know, and uh, it's like uh, it's, uh, everything is out of control. You know, even you guys don't control it. You know, uh, we've got people on the Democrats and on the Republican. You know, they all have their, you, you all have your sides. You know, you need to maybe go back and sit, look at yourself, you know, rather than I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat or I'm a liberal. Liberal is a bad word, you know. If you look at it, what's going on? It's happening everywhere, you know, like it's not just Spokane. And a lot of those homeless people are, that actually lose their homes. They're houseless, they're not homeless, but it sounds 
sounds good when we say they're homeless. I mean, because when you say homeless, what do you, you look down on somebody as scum. But they're not all. You need to look at the, some are criminals, and you need to draw the line. Because when you, this money you throw out there, and you look for drug addicts that don't want to recover, and then you get the grants and you throw the money, they just, they, they manipulated you, and they used the programs. And there's a homeless that wants to get on his feet, but you don't want to hear that. I mean, just, just like the lady said, her, her daughter. I mean, I'm not picking on her, but there are a lot of people, there are thugs out there, there are criminals. And what we do is when you get the liberal, oh, the cops, they abuse, you know? We need to limit their funds. All you're doing is limiting them from doing their job. But yet, when you don't like the cops, but something happens in your neighborhood, who do you call? Why do you think they say they can't? Is it, there's your answer. Because you're a Democrat and you're a Republican, so here you go. You know, that doesn't solve anything. Think about the people. And who suffer while you guys make your decisions? The people. Okay? That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thanks for coming down yeah. and waiting. All right, Kathleen Sharp. Good evening. Welcome, Kathleen. Um, I'm here to voice my objection to Catholic Charities Catalyst Project opening in a residential area. Catholic Charities states that the site was selected because it isn't immediately surrounded by single family homes, but then continues to say that there are 17 homes within 1,500 feet and 71 homes within 2,500 feet, which includes my home. 88 homes within less than half a mile from the site is significant. Additionally, these numbers don't consider apartment buildings home to, home to many families. It's ridiculous to say this is not a residential area. Our community was not given a voice in this decision. Please hear our voices now and help find a better area for this shelter. Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. That brings us to the end of uh, open forum requested testimony. Uh, thanks everyone for sitting through and engaging with your council and letting us know. Thanks council members, thanks staff up there and all around. Really appreciate everyone's commitment to the process. And please take care of yourself. And if you can take care of someone else, we are not meeting next Monday. We're adjourned. Thanks for using WebEx. Visit our website.